my presentation is on uh, planning of bridge spans, configurations, and foundations. So I would be briefly uh, covering the general guidelines, general requirements as per Indian Railway Standard uh, Codes of Practices, and some practical considerations which are of very importance as uh, uh, part of my experience of dealing with the uh, various uh, construction projects uh, as C construction as well as C planning and uh, elsewhere also in RDSO. Now, uh, planning of any infrastructure is very important because a good, a well-planned structure will give a very trouble-free service life at the least cost. So when we uh, go for planning of bridge spans and foundations or any other infrastructure, so our guiding principles are basically the overall economy of the cost of construction, that is the initial cost. Then we also look for the economy of construction time. It should not happen that uh, the structure, construction of structure itself takes years together because that will overall add to the cost of the uh, structure besides reducing the availability of the structure for the public use. Then the economy of maintenance effort, that is also very important. So a new infrastructure, whenever it is being built, one has to have a focus on how it is going to be maintained and the maintenance requirement should be as uh, low as possible. And they should be practically, it should be practically possible to maintain the structure in a good condition for all the, for the complete service life. So with these initial remarks, <clears throat> I have to say some uh, basic things that every bridge site is a unique site in itself and it will have a different topography of course then the different soil conditions then the approaches and its accessibility for various kinds of uh, raw material to reach over there machinery to reach over there will be different hydraulic conditions at each site would be different and many times uh, certain sites are such that they are important from the consideration that there are certain railway affecting works or railway affecting tanks besides the location. So railway is very particular about uh, such uh, railway affecting works or railway affecting tanks. So we have to take into account what are the consequences of any failure of this RAW or RAT. So that way <clears throat> every bridge site is an important site and the references that are available for making a decision are Indian Railway Bridge Manual which has been issued by the Railway Board. Then various codes which are issued by RDSO. One is Indian Railway Standard Substructure Code. Then the Indian Railway Code for Well and Pile Foundations, again issued by RDSO. Then there are certain guidelines which have been issued jointly by CWC and RDSO. Mostly these are in the form of flood estimation reports or there are some reports RBF 15 or uh, like that for the waterway calculations. I think for that a separate uh, lecture had been scheduled earlier in this course, which has been probably taken by Professor Desai and uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Khare. And uh, fortunately, we are having Mr. Uh, Desai, uh, 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 he is present in this presentation also. So in case of any uh, question, we can always uh, raise it. Now, what are the guidelines for fixing location of a major bridge? This is para 308 of bridge manual. The reach of the river, especially the stream, should be straight. Then the river in the reach should have a regime flow, the free, free of wells, eddies, and excess of currents. Then the site should have firm high banks that are fairly inerodible. And in case of a river having the meandering problem, the site should have the site should be located near a nodal point. And what is a nodal point? I will show a figure in the next slide. A nodal point is defined as a location where the river regime does not normally shift and the location serves as a fulcrum about which the river channel swing laterally. That is, all the meeting takes place around this nodal point and no uh, change in uh, location of the river at the nodal point. The site should have a suitable strata up to a reasonable and workable depth for founding piers and abutments. Now, this is the picture showing the nodal point how a nodal point is, can be uh, decided. <clears throat> now, the bridge is normally located where the river section has minimum width. That is again to reduce the overall construction cost. And the bridge should be aligned normal to the river as far as possible. Before, if you go for a skew, then you are basically increasing the length of the bridge. It will not be economical. 
a white khadi for bridge location should be avoided it is obvious location of the bridge with respect to khadi bridge should be carefully decided the bridge should not normally be located where frequent changes occur in the river course or the tendency for aggradation or degradation is manifest and there is problem of bank erosion so all these factors are to be taken care of the approach bank should be secure and not be liable to flash floods or major splits during the floods because if that is happening then the uh, bridge can be commissioned but during the service life there would be problems and there would be uh, obstructions on the uh, free movement of uh, trains or uh, road vehicles the approach bank should not pass through a heavy hilly terrain in marshy land nor cut across a major drainage so as to avoid expensive construction works then the approach bank in the case of constricted bridges should avoid curvature now this is a river you can see it uh, you can see that the banks are fairly stable and the river is flowing uh, confined to the banks which are stable so the water way provided shall be practically equal to the width of the water spread between the stable banks for such a river if our river spills over its banks and the depth of spill is appreciable the waterway shall be increased suitably beyond the bank to bank width in order to carry the spill discharge as well so you can see this in case of you having a comparatively wide and shallow section with the active channel in flood confined only to a portion of the full width of the bank to bank then the waterway will be constricted in such a way that Uh, and it has to be designed from the hydraulic considerations and cost considerations a thorough study of both these factors shall be made before determining the waterway for such a bridge now this is uh, another type of a river the river with alluvial beds and sustained floods the waterway shall normally be equal to the width given by lessee's formula lessee's formula as you all know is applicable for the silty soil conditions in the upper parts of india gangetic plain and punjab and uh, up bihar west bengal like that so this is the formula given by the uh, lessi for working out the waterway requirement here pw is the wetted parameter which is practically the effective width of the waterway because the depth of flows are very very small so the q is the design discharge in cumic and c is the coefficient which is normally equal to 2.67 and it may range actually from 2.5 to 3.5 depending upon the silt factor <clears throat> now this uh, in hilly terrain mountainous regions mostly you find the flash floods the rivers which they they get the discharge all of a sudden because of some uh, uh, storm uh, coming over the region and then you get flash floods you get discharge very quickly so here the bed material is usually not alluvial and it does not uh, erode very quickly so lessee's formulas are not applicable to such rivers so there you will go by the other considerations uh, when you want to fix the waterway now this is another uh, sub mountain stage of a river where you have got uh, boulders and uh, you don't have very rigid rules which can be applied to such rivers so site specific decisions are to be taken based on economic considerations now there are various clauses in substructure and in substructure code uh, of in uh, rdso uh, the any concession in such cases shall be governed this is about the same uh, river which we have seen uh, earlier the configuration of active channels the cost involved in diversion and training of these channels the cost of guidements which will need much heavier protection than the guidements of alluvial rivers and each case shall be examined on merits from both hydraulic and economic consideration and best possible solution is chosen now many times we have to provide number of spans so we have to give number of piers and when we have worked out the uh, waterway of a river and we are providing number of spans so we have to increase the waterway so that effectively we get the same waterway which is actually calculated or worked out so for that we have to increase the uh worked out uh, whatever requirement by adding to the width of the piers that we are adding many times the piers are having uh, different widths at different levels so we have to work out the effective width 
and this is the formula for working out the average weight of a peer many times you have you may have the tapered peers also in such a case you can have the average width at the taking the mean of the maximum width at the bottom and the lesser width at the top and we can take the average of that <clears throat> now the choice of foundation mostly we are providing three types of foundation either the open foundation or the pile foundation or the well foundation so decision on span length to be uh, which is to be adopted depends upon the ratio of the cost of service structure including the cost of foundation versus the cost of superstructure basically the guiding principle is to keep the cost of substructure and the foundation as the same uh, as that of the cost of superstructure that means this ratio has to be equal to nearly equal to 1 but no hard and fast rule depending upon other consideration a minor variation here and there can be done so usually open foundation is suitable for bridges where rock or firm soil subsoil is available at shallow depth and there is not much is covered and there is no uh, deep uh, flowing water in the stream so pile foundations can be quite economical particularly where the foundations have to be built very deep or taken through deep layers of soil subject to little is covered so larger uh, diameter piles can be used for that but then again you have to find you have to uh, work out the uh, soil some soil survey or sub sub soil survey and you have to find out where the pile will be ultimately uh, resting now the estimation of linear waterway can also be done based on various guidelines this i have already told cwc and rdso has jointly issued certain guidelines so for different sub zones they have issued different formula for working out the waterway uh, like uh, zone 1b zone zone sub zone the waterway uh, requirement can be worked out by using this formula 8.60 into q50 raised to the power 1 by 3 so different coefficients are there for different sub zones so this is based on extensive studies conducted by cwc in association with rdso so based on lessis regime width uh, again there are equations which uh, give you the weighted parameter so this is a non equation then based on various other guidelines effective channel in stream river this is a uh, substructure code uh, substructure code of rdso this is given suppose now for example there is a, a river which has got a bank to bank width equal to 18 meter and the active channel width is 9 meter then waterway to be provided can be taken as 9 meter provided it satisfies all the norms in terms of velocity of flow free board clearance hfl etc all these uh, terms uh, and its uh, uh, codal provisions we will see in uh, coming slides and but in the same case if the suppose bank to bank width is 21 meter and the river is flowing full and there is a water is spilling beyond bank by say about 4 meter width in this case the water is to be provided uh, 21 plus 4 that is 25 meter now finalization of span element we have to select a type of bridge also there are different uh, types of bridges pipe culvert rcc box culvert that is for the small minor bridges then you have arch bridges nowadays no more arches are being built uh, you have got rcc oblique psc slab bridges also then girder bridges of course steel or psc then type of bridge shall be selected on the basis of various factors such as design discharge linear waterway requirement velocity of flow is cover depth requirement and approach bank height and soil strata conditions now there are requirements of aflex also code uh, substructure code gives the uh, definition of the aflex what is the aflex so when you construct a linear waterway as is required for the normal flow at a particular location then there is some increase in the water level height upstream side of the bridge and that provides you the extra energy gradient to pass the design discharge through the bridge and the formula for the uh, working out of the aflex is given one can use it it is very simple a is the larger area a, a small a is the smaller area and b is the velocity 
and h is the flex in meters. Now, in case of reverse with erodible beds, full flex as calculated by the formula may not occur because some flow is taken care of by the extra uh, area of flow available due to erosion of the bed. Now, this is the diagram which shows uh, the definition what is clearance and what is uh, freeboard. This F you can see, this is the freeboard and this red line is basically the, uh, you can say calculated HFL. So from calculated HFL to road level or the formation level in case of a railway embankment, that uh, difference is freeboard. And uh, this uh, C is the clearance between the HFL and the soffit of the uh, girder, any girder, the lowest point. The, dis the distance between the lowest point of any girder and the HFL is the clearance. So this is the clearance, both these things I have already told. Now fixing norms for freeboard vertical clearance based on type of bridge selected, there are guidelines how much flex is to be kept and how much vertical clearance is necessary, mandatory, you can say. This is the clearance definition. The minimum clearances for bridges, excluding arch bridges, pipe culverts and box culverts are given in tabular form. This is again from IRS substructure code. If the design discharge is from 0 to 30, the vertical clearance of 2 feet, 3600 millimeter, is to be given. And if it is between 31 and 300, then this vertical clearance is uh, increase 600 to 1200 millimeter and further from 3301 to 3000 the vertical lengths of 1.5 meter is to be kept and above 3 above 3000 cubics a vertical lens of 1800 millimeter that is 1.8 meter is to be kept and all the siphons pipe and box culverts they are designed as a pressure conduits so therefore no clearance are considered necessary for these structures theoretically, but still if somebody can provide some clearance, it is advisable, one should keep it. Now freeboard, again guidelines are there for the freeboard also. This is the first, in black this is the definition of the freeboard. The vertical distance between the water level corresponding to the design discharge Q, including a flux H and the formation level of its approach bank or the top level of the guide bank and the minimum freeboard requirement design discharge to formation level shall be 1 meter. Then suitably, it can be suitably increased if heavy wave action is expected and then competent 32 uh, wave of this requirement is PC or CB. And these are the uh, laid down values of freeboard. If the design discharge is less than 3 QMX, then 600 millimeter minimum, 3 to 30, then 750 millimeter. If it is more than 30, then no relaxation. <clears throat> now, norms for velocity also. For norms of velocity, velocity of flow can be taken as 3 meter per second. Actually, this is the maximum velocity of flow which is permitted. If the velocity of flow is exceeding this, then one has to think of increasing the water weight. So, <clears throat> norms for HFL similarly have been given the computer value of HFL based on depth of flow calculated for assumed water weight it should be in, uh, verified with respect to the observed HFL. There should not be uh, gross violation, gross variation between the two values, that is the C HFL, calculated HFL, and the O HFL, observed HFL. So there should not be wide variation. And if there is a variation, it should be, it should be explainable. Like many times it happens that the uh, some rivers on the upstream side, they are either diverted or some dams are constructed. So that may affect the overall flow conditions to a particular location of where you are, where we want to make a bridge. So that kind of a justification may explain the difference of the two HFL values. Now there are values of N and bed slope of the stream. Everybody is familiar with this famous formula, Manning's equation. Velocity is 1 upon N into R key power, uh, R raised to the power 2, 2 by 3 and S raised to the power 1 by 2 where the slope S is very important in determining the depth of flow at a particular, at the particular location of the bridge. So one has to make the calculations based on two equations. One is the Manning equation and the other is the uh, continuity equation that is Q is equal to V into A or V is equal to Q upon A. So the two equations are to be 
uh, solved simultaneously. They have to be satisfied simultaneously for the velocity and depth of flow. Now the values of n, they have been specified in again IRS, uh, IRS uh, substructure code. For natural channel in fairly good condition, velocity of V is 0 0.030. And natural channel in fairly bad condition, 0 0.040. Natural channel with variable section in some vegetation, 0 0.050, 0, and vegetation growing on banks in very, very bad condition, then 0 0.062, 0 0.10. Now, working out depth of flow for assumed width of water bay, as I have told you, two equations. One is the continuity equation, V is equal to Q upon A, then V is equal to 1 upon N, R to power R to power 2, 3, as raised to power 1 by 2, Manning's formula. So, you have to make some permutation combinations, trial and error method, you have to apply to find out the velocity of flow and the depth of flow. I think uh, this aspect must have been covered by Mr. Desai during his presentation. So this is the equation. You have to do trial and error to satisfy this equation. And finally, you get a depth of flow and the corresponding velocity of flow. <clears throat> now, finalization of the span arrangement, step three is estimating various parameters for the set of assumed value of B and calculated value of D. Chord number one has to keep the flow subcritical usually. That means the F value should be less than one. And for that, you have to work out the value of V. And accordingly, when you determine the depth of flow, you can work out what will be the HFL. Then vertical clearance, again, while designing the bridge, you have to keep the vertical clearance and accordingly you have to keep the height of the pier. Freeboard formation width, formation top top level of the formation you have to decide based on this freeboard. So this is again with respect to the depth of flow that you have calculated. That's why this depth of flow calculation is very important. Now based on the exercise done, the minimum span which satisfy all the laid down conditions, norms. Uh, that is the velocity of flow, HFL, vertical clearance, freeboard, etc. Then we finalize the uh, span arrangement. Right? Now, there are certain practical uh, considerations. Uh, in fact, this is the photograph which I have uh, uh, shown in my presentation uh, initially. But I had certain observations on this uh, photograph also. This is a bridge which has been probably somewhere in uh, Central Railway only or near about it. I do not know the exact location. But uh, a few considerations uh, about this bridge, although it has been constructed and serving well. One thing is that you can see the pile foundation has been provided in this bridge. And you can see the PSC girder, which has been uh, provided. And the single pier and the, some pier width over the pier. So usually, uh, this is based on experience, one should avoid the heavy PSC girders in high seismic zone. Mostly in Maharashtra, uh, it is the zone 3, so it is not a high seismic zone. So such kind of PSC girders if provided, they will not pose any problem. But if the same type of girders, PSC girders, which are very heavy in weight, which has got a lot of mass, if they are constructed in say JNK or uh, Assam, upper reaches of Assam, where the seismic zone is 5, so they will have, they will offer very high seismic forces, which will make the overall design very, very costly. Because if the uh, mass is more, the seismic force will be more. Accordingly, the bending moments over the piers would be more, and your piers would be would have to be designed heavier. So second thing is pile cap. Pile cap has to be constructed in such a way that the top of the pile cap is not above the lowest water level. Here is it is exposed, so that consideration has been violated. So, third thing is uh, about the here single pier has been used. Usually in railway, we are very much concerned about the stability and the safety. So, it is desirable to provide two piers and then one capping beam so that you get better stability and some redundancy also. And then we are also in railway, particularly, we have got a maintenance organization. So, mostly we are concerned about the maintenance of bearings. And uh, for that purpose, one has to get down on the pier top. He has to keep some instru instruments also with him. And many times for uh, uh, jacking up the girder for replacement of bearings or any other maintenance uh, activity, one has to provide some equipments also. So for that purpose, adequate space has to be provided over the pier top. So this is for the designers in general. 
Now, continuing with the uh, presentation, depth of discover is again very important aspect when we have to uh, decide the final founding level of the uh, peer foundation. We have to take care of the discover. And you know, there is general discover, then there are local discovers also. So, para 4.6.1 uh, of the substructure, substructure code gives the probable maximum depth to discover and it has to be estimated considering the local conditions. This is a picture shows the local discover. <clears throat> Where the feasible species, especially for fleshy rivers and with bed having boulders or gravel, sounding to be taken in the vicinity of the site proposed for the bridge for the purpose of determining the depth of discover. So sounding are best taken during or immediately after flood before discover holes had time to silt up. In calculating design depth of discover, allowance shall be made in the observed depth for increased discover due to design discharge being greater than observed discharge, increased velocity due to constriction, increase in discover in the proximity of pier or abutment, that is a local discover. And then there are certain guidelines given in substructure code for uh, taking the design discharge for the foundation, that is QF. So we increase the design discharge for the purpose of working out the uh, is covered depth. So catchment areas up to 500 kilometers, the design discharge is to be increased by 30% and for more than 500 and up to 5,000 kilometers square, 30% to 20% and more than 5,000 up to 25,000 square kilometers, 20% to 10% and less than 25,000 kilometers square, less than 10%. And these are the formula for working out the depth of is covered for foundations. Level beds ke liye, again Lacey's equation, D is a point four seven three QF upon F raised to the power 1 by 3. This D is taken in meters from the top HFL, I think. Yes. And QF is in QMAX and F is the Lacey's silt factor for the representative sample of bed material obtained from discover zone. Now, silt factor is often 1.76 under root M. M is the mean diameter of the bed material, which is worked out by taking the sieve analysis of the bed material. So various values of F are given for different types of materials. Coarse silt, uh, where the weighted mean diameter of the particle is 0.04, the silt factor is 0.35. Similarly, for fine sand, the silt factor is 0.50 or 0.68. Medium sand, 0.96 to 1.24. Coarse sand, 1.47, 1.76 to 1.49, depending upon the mean diameter of the particle. So <coughs> this is the equation, general equation. And where the where due to constriction of the waterway, the width is less than the less is using, uh, then there is an equation for working out the depth of uh, is cover. This is uh, on the same pattern. F value, F value is the same, which we have uh, just seen in the previous slide. And QF is a design, QF is a discharge intensity. That is the total discharge divided by the width. Now, the depth calculated uh, above shall be increased as indicated below to obtain maximum depth of discover for design of foundations, production works, and training works. In straight reach, then depth of discover is 1.25 and moderate band conditions along airplane or guide bands 1.5D. As a severe band, 1.75D. At a right angle band or at the nose of the piers, the depth of discover will be 2D. In severe swells and against mole head of a guide ones, 2.5 to 2.75 D. And in case of clay bed, wherever possible, maximum depth of discover shall be assessed from the actual observation because the Lacey's formula will not work in clay bed. Now, finalization of the foundation depth, design discharge for the foundation, the normal is cover depth. The normal is cover depth is calculated equation one. Then based on the uh, intensity, discharge intensity, second equation. Then maximum anticipation is covered from water veil level corresponding to QF. And then uh, for abutment is 1.25 D for PS 2.2 D. And this is a figure which shows what is the uh, different, what are the different levels. This is the water level. Then you have got this normal bed level in brown. Then you provide this, this is a discover level. 
normal discover level, then green is the maximum anticipated discover level during the design life, entire design life of the bridge. Then this red one is the foundation level where one should found the foundation, whether it is the pile foundation or the well foundation. Right? So the grip length, this is another important thing. The minimum value of grip length in case of open foundation is 1.75 meter in case of ordinary soil. And for deep foundations, bottom foundation shall be taken to such a depth as to provide adequate grip below deepest anticipated. That is mean, that means this is the deep, if there is some uh, anticipated level, then this is further the grip length. You see, this is the grip length. This is written over here also. So grip length, the depth of foundation below water level for design discharge of foundation shall not be less than 1.33 times the maximum depth of its cover. So this is about the founding level. However, if the rock strata is available at the high level, then it is natural to found the foundation at that level. Of course, the keyed, the key, the foundation should be keyed in rock to 0.3 meter, that is one feet about in hard rock and 1.5 meter in case of a soft rock. So depth of foundation is maximum discovered depth from bed level plus grip length. In case of non-discoverable strata, rock strata, the shallow depth, the foundation shall rest at the level suitably keyed into the rock strata, as has been explained above. Right? Now, now I will share some of the experiences which we have, uh, which we have experienced during the planning, design, and construction of a major bridge in Central Railway. That, that is for a doubling project between Jalgaon and Bhusawal. That was at River Wagur. So let us see what are the things. Now, first of thing, first of all, the most important part of any bridge uh, planning or bridge design is the concept design. One has to set his concept right, how the bridge is going to be constructed and for what reason, what are the special uh, situations, special circumstances at the bridge site. And accordingly, one has to develop a concept, how the bridge will ultimately uh, going to come. So, if we go for a wrong concept, then once we have started with wrong concept, then it is a basically uh, you cannot come back. Once you have made some expenditure on uh, design or say many times people can start the construction also. So, once you have done that, you cannot come back and you are bound to uh, follow the same wrong concept till it till the bridge is completed and finally you will not get a good bridge you will have the issues in during the service life of the bridge. So it is very important to devote sufficient time at the stage of conceptual design. So if we can get the concept right, the design will be right and you will get almost uh, uh, very smooth execution of the bridge work and very smooth service uh, life of the bridge. No maintenance troubles practically. Now the aspects which are critical to form, formulate the concept design are the purpose and function of the bridge, the topography and the geology of the site, the local construction skills and availability of material nearby, and then how the girders are to be erected, what will be the method of erection, and aesthetics and environmental aspects, they are to be, uh, aesthetics has to be good and environmental damages should be the minimum. And future inspection and maintenance needs, they are to be taken into consideration and bridge form selection, superstructure and substructure, what type of uh, single pier or double pier as we have discussed earlier, and whether it is going to be a steel bridge or it is going to be a PSC girder or it is going to be a composite girder, all those things are to be uh, thought of in advance. Again, the experience matters a lot in this. So no two major bridges are exactly similar. As we standardize construction methods and even precast most uh, components, the complete designs are yet to be made a factory product. That is a fact. And the need for designer shall always remain as long as we continue to construct the bridges. So the experience can come only by practicing. So those who have worked in construction projects, they are definitely uh, having a very good idea about the difficulties likely to be faced during the construction. So they can uh, be very, very useful. Their, their interaction with them can be very useful in uh, firming up a good concept. Now, this is the general topograph, general uh, site of the bridge. You can see, uh, actually, it, since it is a doubling project, 
So a bridge is already constructed. You can see this is a bridge already there existing. And you can also see there is some other uh, site of a old bridge, which is now it is in disuse. And actually this was a very, very ideal site. And one has made a very uh, normal kind of a uh, bridge by providing reverse curves on both the approaches. But subsequently a new bridge has been constructed, uh, which has got more number of spans, but it is definitely having lesser degree of curvature on both the approaches. So now uh, we were supposed to make another bridge uh, at the same uh, location. So we were not, uh, actually the alignment of the bridge was almost decided. It was to come on this side of uh, the existing track. So there was no possibility of going on the other side unless until we we had uh, to decide uh, having a cut and connection type of arrangement after construction of the bridge, which is usually very, very difficult and very uh, longer blocks are required. So we have not gone into that kind of a adventurous kind of thinking. We have simply constructed a new bridge on this side so earlier bridge was 7 spans of 20.5 meters and now we have provided 10 spans. This was 7 spans of existing bridge. 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, yes. And then we have constructed 10 spans. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there are certain uh, reasons why we have gone for additional spans. We will be discussing that. So this is the existing bridge and these are the uh, borehole data that we have taken into consideration. So we have we have noticed that there the bed bed is okay. We have got a fairly good uh, rocky condition uh, at a sh very shallow depth, about one meter, less than one meter depth. We were getting very good quality of rock. So the decision uh, was in favor of the open foundation for all the peers. And the problem that we, are, we were facing was that, that, uh, that was regarding the abutments because the height of the bridge was about 16, 17 meters. And if we make the normal uh, abutments, then the cost was very, very high. So we have done some uh, exercise and we have found that providing additional spans would be economical because on the uh, Jalgaon side, there was a uh, uh, rock which was uh, at a high level, very uh, near to the existing abutment. So, uh, this is the, uh, about the open foundation that I have already told. Rock was available at a shallow depth and tall piers were there. Hence, portal is conceived to cater for the two tracks. Actually, this bridge was to be constructed initially for the third line uh, and the substructure was uh, to be constructed assuming that the fourth line will also come. So, we have gone for two piers with a capping beam and uh, only one uh, substructure, superstructure only for the one line. And steel composite deck was preferred for ease of track maintenance because we get the ballasted deck. And uh, uh, this is the general practice nowadays. People prefer for uh, ballasted deck. And 20.5 was a non standard, but uh, its design was very easy to be done. So that we did as a non standard design. And this is the innovation that we have done. We have, instead of going for the conventional abutment, we have gone before. Uh, pile foundation with a uh, uh, pile cap at an elevated level. So this has uh, uh, this has and this has helped us to uh, reduce the excavation activity in, in the vicinity of the existing uh, track. Because if you do such kind of activity near the existing, there are issues of safety, and we have we cannot uh, uh, get uh, a caution because that will affect the normal running of the trains. So this, by, do, by adopting this kind of an arrangement, we could run the traffic at a normal speed on the existing track and without endangering the safety, we could get very good, uh, we, 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 could, uh, very, we could do the very fast construction actually. And the cost wise also, it was very economical. And other foundations you can see, they were simple spread foundations. Uh, founding level was less, about one to two meters basically from the existing bed level. This is abutment A1. The rock was dipping towards the transfer stage. The rock was dipping transfer stage. This was the existing embankment, and here this was the rock level, and it was dipping further. So we have made two extra expense on this side, and that has helped us to reduce the cost. 
and we have provided varied type of apartments. So that has again helped us to reduce the cost. This was the final bridge, which was designed for single third line track. Double train. Now it fourth line has also been sanctioned. It has been now, uh, I think it has been constructed also. So this is the inspection arrangement that we have provided around the uh, pier cap. Uh, this is the final GAD. And another thing was just to reduce the heavy cost of uh, stone pitching on this side. We have constructed a long, about 15 meter of wall along the uh, track on this side. Then significant time was devoted for approval of the GAD. About six months we have taken to prepare the detailed GAD. And the GAD was supported by the uh, sub, uh, subsequent sheets. And everything was pre-planned. Even uh, GAD was uh, in itself complete. And uh, no subsequent issues were faced during the execution because of uh, devoting sufficient time in planning. And multiple divisions, usually they are routine. Uh, and that shows that the people are interacting, field people are posing the new problems, and the design people are taking care of those problems, incorporating changes in the GAD and other things. So that kind of deliberation is very important. An entire design and approval was completed within a time frame of six months, including design basis note. This is another unique thing which we have developed during this work. We prepared a design basis note first. Rather, it was developed uh, along with the design. And it has worked as a uh, standard uh, design basis note. So this is the foundation shape. And this is a picture of the kind of rock we, were found, we, we have found. This is the construction of two piers. This is the final view. And this is the backfill material that we have provided on the approach. Usually in major bridges, there is a problem of approach getting a uh, problem of sinking during the traffic. In first monsoon, usually you get a lot of complaints about the sinking of approaches. But in this case, there had not been any single case reported because everything was meticulously planned and shown in the drawings and our RDSO's special instructions regarding approach slab were implemented in this bridge in real sense. This is the abutment A2 design. This is a still two type of a arrangement on approach. And this is the final. If the existing bridge is the final bridge that has come up. My presentation, it would basically consist of uh, these particular contents. That is, I'll focus a little bit on the principle of the pre-stressing, uh, how the stress analysis for a section is calculated, then the properties and the specifications of the pre-stressing steels, the various anchorages that are used, and then the permissible stresses in the concrete and the loss of the pre-stress. And uh, finally, some concept of the cable zone as well as the anchorage zone I will be covering. So this particular uh, picture or the slide, it just shows you the basic principle of the pre-stressing. So here, you are, uh, let me put the pointer on. Yeah. So you are having, let's say, the blocks separated out, okay? If I'm just loosely holding them, they are going to have the sagging nature of this. But when I'm applying a force at the end, okay, they are all in a linear way held, uh, connected together and hold it pressed together. So this is the basic, uh, what you can say, the principle of pre-stressing, which is that you are applying a huge compressive force at the ends. And uh, so as con uh, compared with your conventional reinforced concrete, okay, wherein your uh, high tensile strength of the steel, okay, it is combined with the concrete compressive strength to form a structural material which is strong both in compression and tension. So this particular figure, it shows you your conventional RCB where underneath the loading, you are having compression as well as the tension induced and tension is taken care of by the steel whereas the compression is being taken care of by the concrete. 
So unlike this conventional reinforced concrete, here in the priestess concrete, the steel is serving a different purpose. The steel here, it is used to develop a high compressive stress. Okay, in the through this high strength steel tendons, and uh, this is induced before the loads are actually applied, and um, and that particular thing what is does is it counterbalances the tensile stresses that are imposed in the member during its service period. So this particular pre-stress force that is shown over here, it is is induced in the concrete by means of this pre-stressing steel. And because of this huge compressive force that is acting over here at some eccentricity, this particular tension which would have been generated otherwise, that is being nullified and we ensure that your sections throughout your span of your member, they remain in compression. And the, this particular compression now, whatever the stresses are induced, they are obviously now taken care of by the concrete material. <clears throat> so in this particular um, uh, pre-stress beam where you are having a pre-stressing force which is applied at some eccentricity, the concept is very simple, that of your direct and the bending stresses. So uh, this particular member, it is subjected to what we call in the solid mechanics language, that is it is subjected to the direct and bending stresses. The direct and the bending stresses, because of this force, the pre-stressing force, which is applied at the end of the member at some eccentricity. So you are having the first of all, the compressive stress, direct stress induced, that is P by A. And along with it, you are having the bending stress induced. Now, this bending stress is we have to ensure that this bending stress, whichever is developed, it is exactly in the opposite way to which the loading bending stresses will be induced. And that is the basic principle of your pre-stressing. So here, this pre-stressing force, it is applied at some eccentricity, which is below the neutral axis. So what happens is, because we are applying this force below the neutral axis, Access. Uh, I'm talking this is a case of a simply supported beam. So what happens because of this pre-stressing force is that this beam, it will be hogged. You're going to have the hogging bending, stress, the hogging nature of bending moment that will be developed over the entire length of the beam. Whereas if we talk about the loading, the loading is inducing a sagging bending moment over the entire length. So these two diagrams, if we just superimpose, ideally, they things gets nullified. And actually, the basic principle of pre-stressing is that you're, you should have a stress-free, uh, what you can say, sections all over the section. But that is not actually possible. But, so uh, here we have now this first case is your direct and bending stresses because of your pre-stressing force. And the second, there are two diagrams which have been separate each for dead load as well as the live load and basically it is going to produce a tension at the bottom and the compression at the top so now if i just superimpose all these values together i get my resultant stress wherein this particular tension that is being actually produced because of the loading during the service, it has been nullified by this compressive stress that is developed over here. So what I finally get is a resultant diagram which is having compressive stress throughout the entire section. This is the one type of the compressive stress diagram which I can get. The other possibility of the diagrams can be, which is the most ideal thing, that I can have a zero value of the stress at the bottom fiber. That is exactly this tensile stresses are matched with the uh, stresses that are produced because of the pre-stressing. So we can have the magnitude of this P and E chosen in such a way that I can have this ideal condition of zero tensile stress at the bottom. The other possibility of the diagram is that if my uh, loading, bending stresses because of the loading, if they are of having a higher magnitude than this, there can be a possibility of a small amount of tensile stresses that is developed at the bottom. But this amount of tensile stress, if it is within the uh, limit of the permissible tensile stress of the concrete, it is well and good. Or otherwise, if it exceeds, then again, we have to go for the, what we call it as a partial pre-stressing, that is for the over and above tensile stresses, we again have to provide some additional reinforcement to take care of these um, uh, stresses. So this is the basic fundamental, what you can say, the stress analysis that we can calculate the stresses at the section. 
In this case, you can just see that why this eccentricity is uh, given. The basic, um, what you can say, the logic behind that, if I plot E is equal to zero, that is, I just apply a compressive concentric force, then what is going to happen is, yes, I will again be able able to nullify these tensile stresses. But what happens is at the top fiber, you can see that there is an addition of all the compressive stresses. P by A is compressive, Mg by Z is compressive, Mq by Z is also again compressive. So you may have a higher value of compressive stress developed at the top. What by providing eccentricity, what we are doing is we are inducing some amount of tensile stress in the initial stage and that particular the uh, thing that it gets negative and so what happens is again the amount of the compressive stress reduces otherwise uh, if we just provide it at the center we will have to use again a very high grade of concrete or this thing to uh, take care of the high compressive stress so that is the logic that the you are having the uh, pre-stressing force applied at some eccentricity and throughout this particular span we can just have this particular particular E value uh, modified and suited as per uh, to take care of the various bending stresses that are evolving because of the bending moments because of the loading. So to have this particular pre-stressing, you're actually having specifically, I will be uh, showing you to the two methods. That is a method of pre-stressing. That is one is the pre-tensioning and the other one, it is called as a post-tensioning. So uh, let's see what you mean by pre-tensioning. The pre-tensioning technique, obviously, as the word suggests, the tensioning of the cable, okay, it is done before the concrete, it is hardened, or before, I will say, the concrete has achieved its some specified uh, compressive strength. So if you just see the schematic diagram, which has been shown over here, the courtesy is through NPTEL courses, this particular uh, diagrams have been taken. Uh, you are having a mold through which you apply, uh, you put um, cables, that is a, uh, steel cables, and you tension these. Once these are tensioned to the prerequisite values, and uh, then you pour into the concrete. And this particular um, arrangement, it stays over there till the uh, concrete, it achieves its desired strength. And here the proper bond is developed between this steel tendons or the steel cables or the steel strands, steel wire. These are the different names that I can use for this. Uh, the proper bond is developed between the steel and the concrete. And once this bond is developed and the desired compressive strength is achieved, uh, the concrete is hardened. What we do is we cut off this cable. Now this particular steel had been stretched. Now uh, this stretching is done, uh, the tensioning is done within the elastic limit only. So now what happens is once these tendons are cut, since it was within the elastic limit, it, the steel would try to go back to its original position. But uh, since there is a bond that has been now developed between the steel and the concrete, the steel along with as it goes back to its original position, it pulls the entire concrete through it. And you can see that the compression is ex uh, forces exert. And then you are cutting out the cable. And uh, with that, what happens is uh, the steel, it tries to go back to its original position. And while doing so, it takes along with it, the concrete along with it. And through the entire region, the compressive stress is induced. So the next is the post-tensioning. Here now, as the words, the tensioning is done after the concrete it achieves its strength. So what is the process over here is you are having again a casting bed. The mold is there, and you are having now a duct that is uh, uh, put into this particular member prior to uh, so that uh, yeah, there is a hollow that is passed over here. Then the concreting is done. The concreting, after the concreting is done and the concrete achieves its strength, you pass in the uh, steel cables through it. And uh, now, in this case, uh, still with the concrete, at one end, you are having fixity and at the end, you pull these particular cables to the desired amount of the length as to get the desired amount of strain induced. And uh, then you anchor it by means of some anchoring devices. So this particular cable is now pulled condition. And as now once you uh, tighten it, what happens is now this particular cable will try to uh, will, it will try to go back to original, but because of the 
encourages at the end, it is allowed to do so, and so end reactions that will be dense. So now this particular end reaction is the form of the compressive force. Again, the entire cells of, of, of this material will be subjected to the compression. So the basic difference of the pre-tensioning and post-tensioning is that the uh, stresses are transferred through the bond by in case of the pre-tensioning, where here it is trans. It is generally in the form of the strands that are most commonly used, but there are other things also. You can have just the wires, you can have the strands, or you can have the bars. So uh, SC uh, 11220 has permitted to use uh, various of these uh, that includes the late hard Limited hard drawn stress relief wires, high tensile steel bars, and even the stress relieved uncoated stress relief strands uh, with the normal relaxation as well as the low relaxation. And the characteristics of these all steel, it has been uh, uh, given in the 18.3 to 18.5 tables. Uh, so, this is what it is. The first is the use of the hard drawn stress relief wires. Wherein the wire diameters we are having typically from about 5 mm and 7 mm, with the uh, strength ranging from uh, 1570 to about 17. But as I said, the most commonly used are the strands, and the strands, single strands, are not in the form of the multiple strands. And uh, the common form of stressing is the sapphire strand, uh, is, um, which is having, you can have, see that you are having an inner core wire inside with six outer wires twisted around it. Strands are the multiple strands. So for the post-tensioning, 13 mm or 15 mm diameters is usually used. So in the strands used, and it can be used singly or in the bundles to form the multi-strand uh, tendons. Uh, so these are the tables related with the specifications that are given for C one one two stress relief strands, which is there for the normal relaxation as well as the low relaxation. And the designation of these strands is generally, uh, as I said, seven ply is the most commonly used. That is what has been specified over here also. So the nominal area as well as the breaking load has been given. Uh, for the stress chain properties, that particular uh, uh, taken elaboratedly by uh, Umesh Rajesh Kirke and is given in the section 6.25 of your IRC 112. Apart from that, you can also use the bars directly to uh, tension uh, to produce the pre stressing. And the bars are generally placed there, which are in the concrete between two and the tops. So the maximum pre-stressing force that can be applied to the structure immediately after transfer. When I say immediately after transfer, means uh, the, during the process after you are pre-tensioning and you are uh, anchoring the things. Okay, the final pre-stress that is uh, transferred to the concrete it in, uh, has to uh, take into consideration all the losses. Also, we are going to talk about this in detail in the coming slides. So after taking care of all the losses in the pre-stress that takes place, this particular maximum pre-stressing force, it shall not be greater than 75% of your FPK, or it might be 0.85 of the 0.1% proof load, whichever is less. So apart from now this particular pre-stressing skill, let's go ahead with talking about now the anchorages that can be used. So uh, at each end of your tendon or the cable, your force is transferred into the concrete, obviously, by the uh, proper anchorage system. So for the pre-tension uh, stands, as I told you, the anchorage is because of the bond. But um, in case of the post-tension tendons, the anchorage it is achieved by using the anchor blocks or an encased dead-end anchor. So what are these different anchorages systems? Let's see in the uh, further slide. So here you are having some photographs I have taken from the net uh, to show you what kind of anchorage systems can be used. This particular figure is the central one. It shows you the uh, single strand anchorage system, whereas this particular figure, it shows you the multiple strand anchorage system. So this way, there are various systems that are available. Uh, the patented systems are there. The uh, commonly used is the Fresenite system, uh, which actually works on the wedge principle, wedge action. 
for the anchorage. So you are having the female and the male cone over there. And then once you pre-stress, this wedge actions get developed and uh, the things are anchored. Uh, there are other patented systems also that are available. These are some of them. Apart from this principle of wage action, there is another principle by which the anchorage can be obtained that is called as a direct bearing. So this particular figure, it shows you the principle of anchoring or uh, using the principle of direct bearing using the button heads. So at the end of this, the head is just in, enlarged in the diameter and that ensures that your uh, strands or the bars, they are uh, anchored well. The next uh, another principle of anchoring is by means of the looping of the wires. This is this principle is generally used in case of the dead end uh, of your slabs. So what is done is each strand it is just open up to form a bulb, okay? And uh, so that uh, and this particular bulb it is just tied with the reinforcement at these ends. And once now the concreting is done, since this uh, end has been enlarged uh, um, over here, so proper anchoring is achieved. So uh, these three principles, either by wedge action or by the direct bearing or in by case of the looping of the wire, these are the various ways in which the anchorage of the strands can be done. So what does uh, again IRC 112 says about the anchorage? Uh, it says that the following types of anchorages can be used in the bridges. One is the anchorage is partially or fully embedded in the concrete in which the pre-stressing is transferred within the body of pre-stress element by the combination of these three actions, the bearing, friction and wedge action. Or you may have externally mounted anchorages that is by means of providing a bearing plate, right? So that the transfer of the pre-stressing force of the tendons to the concrete, it takes place through the bearing plate. Here, obviously, we need to check the uh, bearing stress uh, stresses. The check of the bearing stress has to be made. So the minimum requirements uh, have been given in clause 13.2.2 of IMC 112. It says that the anchorage device, it should be capable of holding and transferring the force of not less than 95% of its actual mean tensile ultimate strength of the tendon. So it has the, the capacity of the anchorage device should be that it should be uh, withstanding 95% of your ultimate tensile strength of your cables. Apart from this, uh, even the fatigue uh, 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 parameter is also taken into consideration. What it says that it should be able to withstand not less than 2 million cycles of fatigue load. So proper testing, prior testing has to be done for the fatigue and it should be able to withstand 2 million cycles of fatigue load. So these are the clauses that have been given in IRC 112. And uh, uh, behind the anchorages, you are having the bursting reinforcement that is provided in the uh, members to take care of the very high tensile stresses that are induced in this anchorage zone. So just behind your anchors, since there is a huge amount of uh, concentrated load acting just behind the bearing plate, you need to provide some additional reinforcement to take care of the bursting tensile stresses, bursting forces there. Let's go to some other uh, uh, parts that are required. That is, you require now the sheathing ducts. So sheathing duct, it is generally provided. The two materials are used. One is the mild steel material, or you may have HDP material. So when you're using the mild steel ducts, the thickness of the metal sheathing, it shall not be less than 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0 0.5. Uh, it depends upon the diameter which you are using. The internal diameter is up to 50 mm, 75 mm, 90 mm, and above. So uh, apart from this, as I told you, the commonly used nowadays, it is the high density polyethylene, that is HDP sheathing ducts are used. And the code, again, it says that you can have the diameter wall thickness of 2 mm, 2.5 mm, 3 mm, and 4 mm for the internal diameters of 50, 85, 100, and 125 respectively. So these are the sheathing ducts. You need to have the couplers also provided to connect uh, these uh, sheathing ducts. So the ducts can uh, be joined through these couplers. And uh, either you can use the corrugated threaded sleeve couplers, or if you are having MS uh, this thing ducts, you can have the integration of the two ends by welding also, or you can even use the heat shrink couplers. 
So these are the three ways in which you can just uh, join the duct lens. These are the photographs of the stressing jack through which we can just stress the cables. The first figure it shows you for jacking the single strand, whereas the second figure it shows you a jack for the multiple strand tendons. <coughs> Apart from this, you're having the protective grouting that has, needs to be provided because post tension, the cables are running through the duct. So to have a proper bonding to the concrete, we require that you should feel that ducts through the cement grout. And uh, the ducts have to be filled, uh, filled fully without leaving any entrapped air or water pockets. And um, this also would also help uh, against the corrosion of the tendons also with the grouting process. So this now uh, figures, now they show you actually now the total process of how a post-tension girder is erected. So first we are having the fabrication of the reinforcement. In this we are having the ducts laid down according to the profile what is desired. And um, so this photo it shows for one is the eye girder and another is the cox girder. Then the concreting is done and after that, uh, through these ducts, you are having the placement of your tendons that are passed through these um, ducts. Then you are having the stretching of the cables done as per the requirement uh, as to how much distressing force is required. You just pull the cables and then you anchor it. And once you anchor it and then you transfer this particular thing to the desired site and then you have a beautiful completed bridge that is seen over here. So this particular total process, as you can see that you are having a different stages of loading. Uh, so this particular loading, it can be basically divided into three uh, categories. The first part of the loading is your initial loading, which again is further divided into two stages. That is during the tensioning of the steel, where your uh, force applied is the highest uh, in the entire process. And then the losses takes place. So you are having the another stage of the loading where we say that is a, it's a transfer of the pre-stress to the concrete. That is a, a stage which we call it as a transfer stage. Then you are having one intermediate stage where you have the loads uh, that needs to be taken care of because of the transportation of these members to the site. And then you are having the final stage of loading, which is again can be subdivided into two stages. One is at the service and the other is at the ultimate, the ultimate which we talk in case of the extreme events. But uh, throughout for general uh, design and analysis purpose, what we generally consider is these two things. One is at the transfer of the pre-stress of the concrete, which we call it as the stage one. And finally, at the service, that is what we call it as stage two. So uh, the other things can be taken care of, but uh, over and up uh, thing that these are the two stages that we uh, generally take care of. That is at the transfer of the pre-stress to the concrete and the final stage, what we call it as a stage two, that is at the service. Uh, and at these two stages, what you need to uh, take care is that at any of these stages, the loading, whatever it is, the, you have to provide the member sizes and the pre-stressing force and everything in such a way that your permissible stresses are taken care of. The permissible stresses in the concrete are taken care of. Two things, tensile stresses as well as the compressive stresses. Now, if I talk about the permissible stresses of, uh, in the, uh, uh, of the tensile stresses in the concrete, you are having three categories again into it. Uh, uh, there are three categories, what we say is the type one uh, type of structures, type two and type three. What does this mean is type one means uh, in no case there should be any tensile stresses that are induced in your structure. So that is what uh, we started with the stress calculation diagram, which I show the stress at the bottom of your uh, member. If I'm talking about a simply supported girder, there you should have zero or the entire section should be in the compression. That's it. There is another thing that is type two, where we call it as a limited pre-stressing. Yes, here we allow some amount of tensile stress, a small amount of tensile stress. Uh, but that should be within the permissible limit of your concrete. Uh, concrete should be able to protect those tensile stresses. So there should not be any cracking of the concrete that should be taken uh, taking place. So this particular tensile stress, it is limited to 3 MPa. So this is the capacity of the concrete. It can very well take care of this small amount of the tensile stress. 
And the last uh, type is the partial pre-stressing, where yes, now your concrete is unable to take uh, the stress. It cracks, so cracking is permitted, but that crack width uh, limits are there and those uh, whatever now your hypothetical tensile stress that are existing near the cracks uh, the, those are given in the table 10 and they are to be modified as per figure 6 that i will show you in the next slide so these are the hypothetical stresses that you need to take uh, for the type three types of member and depending upon the depth of the member these stresses they will be multiplied by this depth factor and you will get the uh, permissible tensile stress for type three members this we talk about the tensile stress let's go for now the compressive stress so as i told you we are specifically concentrating on only two uh, stages one is at the transfer and one will be your in the service period that is a working stage so the permissible stresses uh, at transfer they have been now given in the code this is as per as one three four three have taken from there uh, so the computation of the maximum permissible compressive stress in lecture at transfer so for post tension work and pre tension work and it depends upon now um, it's the factor of actually FCI. What is FCI? FCI is your strength of the concrete at transfer. So when you are actually doing the pre-stressing work, when the stress uh, is transferred from the steel to the concrete, it is that particular stage. And similarly, the permissible stresses at the working stages have been given. Uh, that was actually now a function of your FCK, that is your characteristic strength of your concrete. So again, depending upon the grade of the concrete, which starts from M30 to M60 and above, uh, you can get the permissible values through this particular uh, interpolation uh, theory that can be applied to this. So let me go fast now. It's already just five to uh, five minutes to four. Now we come to the next part of my presentation. What I was talking about is the losses in the pre-stress. So as I said that when you're actually pre-stressing, but uh, at the transfer or in the latter stage, the final value of pre-stress, what it remains is only about 75 to 85% of the pre-stresses, pre-stress which you're actually doing at the time of the jack packing. So these losses, they are categorized into two types. One is immediately, that is a loss that occurs uh, once the transfer takes place. And the second is your long-term losses. Now, actually speaking, let me just um, um, give you the fundamental of this actual loss, what it actually means is this particular diagram, again, I have taken from the NPTEL series of the lectures. So here, this uh, very uh, beautifully, the, this particular concept of loss is explained through this particular figures. So let's say I'm having the original length of my steel rod as L1, and the original length of the beam is L2. So what is done is now I'm pulling this particular length of L1 to L2 so that I can anchor it over here. So this delta L, whatever is the elongation that I'm going to produce, that will be inducing the original tensile strain in the steel of the magnitude, the strain that is L2 minus L1 upon L1. Okay, but now once I anchor this, okay, what is going to happen is once the compressive force is acting on this particular member, since now the concrete is also an elastic material, it is having the modulus of elasticity, the concrete. So it undergoes the elastic shortening. So what happens is the original length of the your beam L2, it gets reduced to L3 because of the elastic shortening of the beam because of the application of your compressive force. So this particular now, uh, this much strain, that is L2 minus L3 upon N1, this is nothing but this is now some residual strain that has been developed when I'm considering as respect to the original steel. Similarly, what happens is there are long-term losses also, that is because of the creep and the shrinkage. Again, there is a further reduction in the length of your beam. So the final length of the pre-stress beam, it becomes L4. So considering these uh, losses, again, what happens is if I consider to the original length of my steel, that is L1, and now the final length of the beam as L4, the residual strain in the steel, it becomes L4 minus L1 upon L1. So this particular residual strain that is what is there, it is the culprit which is generating this particular loss, what we say loss in the pre-stress. 
So typically these losses, I will just go a little bit fast now. Uh, the losses, they are what you say is the immediate and the time dependent. Immediate in case of post tension only we are talking about, they will be because of friction, anchorage slip and elastic shortening. Right now what I explained, the elastic shortening. And you're having time dependent, which is creep, shrinkage, as well as the relaxation of the steel. So due to the friction now, again, these all clauses, they have been given in IS, uh, IRC 112. Uh, so because of the friction, uh, you are having the loss where the <clears throat> there is a reduction in the pre-stressing force and that particular expression has been given. Uh, this is dependent on uh, three parameters. That is one is the alpha angle, one is the coefficient of friction and one is called as a wobble effect. That is the key. So uh, the cumulative angle through which your entire cable, it changes, okay? When I'm talking from one end to the other end, whatever is a change in the cum angle, cumulative angle, that is called as alpha. You're having mu, that is self-explanatory, that is the coefficient of friction between the tendon and its duct. And you are having one factor, which is called as a wobble uh, factor, that is a wave effect because of the profile of the cable, there is some reduction, there is an increase in the friction, and this particular factor, that is the wobble factor, as well as the coefficient of friction, it has been mentioned in the table 7.1 of IRC 112. So depending upon the type of the duct and the type of the steel that you are using, you have to choose these particular values to find out the loss due to the friction. The next is the loss because of the anchorage slip. Anchorage slip means actually it is a loss due to the wedge drawing of your anchorage device. So when you are pulling this thing, the total wedges, they get drawn in that by some amount. Okay, that amount, let's say that is delta. And because of this, now you are again having the loss of the stress. That is the ES value into the, again, the strain. That strain is delta upon L. The Third type of your loss is the elastic shortening of the concrete that right now with the figure I had showed you. So this loss is fundamentally, it is again the same thing, the loss of stress. It is the modulus of elasticity of the steel into now the uh, strain, elastic strain in the concrete, which is occurring because of the compressive force that we are ex uh, exerting on that particular member. So ES into epsilon EC, this is the elastic strain in the concrete that gives you again the loss because of the elastic shortening of the concrete. Apart from that, these three were the immediate losses. You are having the long-term losses. That is a loss because of the shrinkage of the concrete. So loss because of the shrinkage of the concrete will be again be the same fundamental formula. ES into now the strain because of the shrinkage. So this particular strain, that is a total shrinkage strain, it is actually composed of now two components. Uh, you will be having uh, one is the autogenous shrinkage strain and another will be the drying shrinkage strain. So the total value of these two, that will be your total shrinkage strain. So again in IRC 112, they have been given the table 6.6, .6, which gives you both this uh, strain. The table 6.6 .6 gives you the autogenous shrinkage strain, uh, which develops because of the hardening of the concrete. So there's a typo error. This should be 10 raised to minus 6. Uh, and it depends upon the grade of the concrete. So depending upon the grade of the concrete, the total autogenous shrinkage strain can be found out. And this strain multiplied by ES, that is the modulus of elasticity of the steel, that will give you the loss because of the shrinkage. Similarly, the drying shrinkage strain and this particular shrinkage strain, it develops slowly, uh, specifically after the curing period. So uh, this particular value of the drying shrinkage strain, it is now given by this particular formulation that is KH into uh, epsilon CD. Epsilon CD is again the unrestrained drying shrinkage values that depend upon the relative humidity of that particular area in which your structure is there. And it depends upon again the um, uh, concrete strength. Not only this, now this particular KH factor, it depends upon on the notional size. Now, what is the notional size? It is the parameter of uh, what you can say the cross-sectional parameter uh, related to what is actually ex exposed to the drying condition. So it is given by 2 AC upon U, where AC is your concrete cross-sectional area, and U is the perimeter of uh, that part of the cross-section which is exposed to the drying. 
So you can find out this notional size through that you can find out KH. That KH, you put it over here. You get the unrestrained drying shrinkage from here, put it over here, and you get the uh, uh, total drying uh, shrinkage strain from here. Uh, I will skip this part. This particular earlier, what I showed, that was a total shrinkage strain at the end of, let's say, about 60, 70 years. But at any period of time, if you have to find out, let's say, if I want to find out the strain at uh, the end of one year only, then that also can be uh, put up. That is given in the appendix in 112. And so at any particular, as a function of time, at any stage, I can find out again the shrinkage because of autogenous as well as the drying shrinkage. Uh, they are dependent upon these factors uh, uh, related with time only. So you calculate this factor beta, put it over here and multiply it through the uh, autogenous shrinkage strain. That is a total autogenous shrinkage strain which you have found out. Same is the case for the drying shrinkage also. It depends upon again the notional size. It depends upon the time at which you want to calculate the strain and it depends upon the age of the concrete when the curing has been stopped. So you put these all these things in this, get this beta factor and multiply it uh, the, and you will get the shrinkage at any time t. So this t, if I want to find out, let's say at one year, I will putting this t in ages in the days, that is 365 over here. So this is all about the shrinkage strain. The next is similarly, you have the loss due to the creep. Uh, for the creep, um, uh, what is specified in the code is you have to find out a creep coefficient. This creep coefficient, it is defined as the creep strain upon the elastic strain of the concrete. So uh, this creep coefficient phi, okay, that is your creep strain, that is epsilon C, and the elastic strain in the concrete, that is EC upon FC. FC is your stress in the concrete at the level of steel. So you, if you know this now fine, I can find out this creep, uh, creep strain. And this coefficient value of this creep coefficient, it is again given in the table 6.9 of IRC 112. That is over here. Uh, and again, this is the total uh, that, that is at the age of about 70 years or more. So it is a total creep strain that you are finding out. And uh, it again depends upon the parameter of your relative humidity and the notional size that is your 2 AC upon U, as well as at what day you are loading the particular structure. This table, it is actually given for M35 grade. For any other grades higher than this, the same is applicable. But for lower grade, you have to multiply it by the factor of under root of 45 by FCM. FCM is the whatever grade of concrete that you are going to use. Again, the code gives you the development of the creep uh, with the time also. So at any time t, you can find out the creep strain. It again depends upon this particular formulation. If the parameters that are considered to find out this beta factor, it is again the relative humidity and the notional factor that is H0. For, uh, and it also includes the uh, strength of the concrete also. For uh, strength of the concrete, uh, that is the characteristic strength of the concrete less than 45, you use this formula for finding beta. For greater than higher grade of concrete, there is another formulation given. So you can find out this beta factor and multiply by the uh, total creep strain, which you have found out using that uh, creep coefficient for 70 years. And the last uh, type of loss, that is a relaxation loss. This is because of the relaxation of the steel, which is there in the stressed condition for years together. So as the uh, time passes, this, uh, there is a relaxation that takes place. And that particular loss, again, we have to take into consideration. So table 6.2 gives you this loss directly in terms of the percentage of your initial stress. So this particular relaxation loss, it depends upon the initial stress that you are going to uh, induce to your tendons. So this is all about the losses. You calculate all these six losses and take care of this in the design. And finally, just five minutes more if I can have it, because there was a lot of disturbance in between. Otherwise, I would have finished by four. Anyway, the last concept, that is the concept of the cable zone that I just wanted to put forward. So um, as we had seen, I had shown in the figure of that uh, priestess girder, you are having the cable profile uh, uh, through the entire length of the beam. How that is particular thing done? So it is based on the concept of your cable zone, wherein, uh, first of all, you have the preliminary proportionate uh, uh, proportioning of your size of your girder uh, as per the uh, 
um, uh, what you can say section modulus that is required. You design what is the amount of the pre-stressing force that is required for uh, resisting the bending moments. But then the corresponding eccentricity also has to be found out. So as to satisfy all these three things, that is Z uh, value, the pre-stressing force as well as the eccentricity, all these three things actually need to be defined such that you satisfy the limits that are specified for the permissible stresses at the stage of transfer as well as at the stage of your service load. Now, at the transfer, when I'm talking about the permissible limits, what the care I have to take is, so stage one is that stage where you are transferring the stress. So at that time, there is no uh, live load that is acting on the structure. So uh, the uh, what you can say, the probability that the tension will be developed will be definitely at the top because you are hogging the particular member by applying the pre-stressing force uh, at the bottom of the neutral axis. So the probability of the tension getting developed is at the top and the compression is at the bottom. Exactly reverse thing happens when it is in the working stage. Now the live load is there in coming into the picture during the service period. So now the probability that the tension will be getting developed will be definitely at the bottom. So that uh, there will be tension that can be induced. If at all, it will be at the bottom and there will compressive stress will be at the top. So now I have to check for the permissible tensile stress condition over here. Permissible compressive stress at the bottom. Similarly, for steam. Stage two, the permissible condition for the tension at the bottom and the permissible compressive stress at the top. So this is the fundamental that I have used and accordingly you can just see over here. So the stage one that I'm talking about, what will be my, <clears throat> when I'm talking about the uh, cable zone, that is uh, the zone in which I can just place my cable so as to ensure no tension condition. So for the stage one, you are going to have the uh, give, you are going to keep the value of the stress zero at the bot, uh, at the top because of this thing that right now I explained that is the probability of tension being developed will be at the top. So this is the stress diagram that I will be using for developing the cable zone concept. Okay. And similarly for the stage two, right now what I said that the probability of tension being developed will be at the bottom. I have to restrict that tensile stress and I have to keep it to the zero value. So this will be the diagram that I will be using to find out my cable zone wherein the zero value of the stress will be there at the bottom fiber. So using this particular two uh, diagrams, Okay, I can find out the cable zone. Cable zone, I mean, is you are putting the cables at that particular zone so that you are ensuring no tension condition. This is specifically for the type 1 structure that I'm talking about. So this is a stage 1 diagram. That is a stress diagram that I have shown over here. This is a stage 2. The stress diagram that is a probable st stress diagram that I have shown over here. I am now in the process of finding the eccentricity that is the position of the cable or the CG of the cable where it should be. So have the no tension condition. So here now I'm going to use the principle of the internal uh, moment um, developed. That is the internal moment resisting couple principle. So here if I'm providing now the eccentricity over here, this is your P force that is acting. This is the stress resultant diagram. So the total resultant force, that is a compressive force, will act at the CG of this triangle. Similarly, at stage two, same thing. You are having the eccentricity provided over here. So this is your P force, but the compressive force that is a, uh, will be acting at the CG of this diagram, that is, it will be shifted over here. So these are the distances that of the compressive force KB and KT. These are nothing but the current distances that I need to ensure because I want the no tension condition. So KT and KB, that is the current distance. They are well defined. All of you know that. That is I over AY. That is how you obtain the current distance. And now uh, I can just see this. I want to find out this particular permissible value of the eccentricity. So what I do is I apply the internal moment resisting couple principle and I equate the external moment with the internal moment that has been developed. Internal moment is developed because of the virtue of this couple, that is P and C, which is separated by this distance A, that is the lever arm. So you are having Mg is equal to P into A. This A, that is a lever arm, in terms of E1 and Kb, it can be written as this E1 minus Kb. So what I get is an expression of the eccentricity 
density in of the bending moments in terms of the initial pre-stressing force and the current distance. This mg in terms of friction in x, that is the bending moment expression. Similarly, for the eccentricity at the, that similar ascent concept, the moment, now the moments are because of the dead load as well as the line load, those are equated with the P in A, and again I get an expression for E2. Plug up these values of the bending moments and all those things. I will get a zone which I have just illustrated over here. One particular example. Let's say I am having this uh, dead load act acting over here. This is your reaction. Then the mo bending moment expression. Everybody at any section xx, I have just put it. It will be R A into x minus G x square by two. So this moment, if I just put it in my expression of my eccentricity, I am going to get this particular expression in terms of x. Similar expression for E two also. So there you are having the bending moment because of dead load as well as live load. So this expression of bending moment changes. So I am having now the expression of E2 also. So in this now, if I, this is just an illustration, I have just put some values, uh, or assumed some K value and this thing. So if I put it, I am going to get something like this, that is E1 and E2. So for starting, uh, that is at from the end to the center, that is, let's say if this uh, beam is of 20 meters span, then from zero to 10 meters, that is up to the center of the beam, I am getting this, what you can see a zone or the zone in which if I'm laying down the cable, I will ensure the zero tension condition. So the you can just see at zero meter, it is 226 and 188. So it is 188 and 226. Similarly, at the center, it just merges to Together it is 464 and 406. So though rotted, so this particular E1 and E2 that is called as a cable zone. So I will do this in two parts. Okay. The first part I'm going to give you the fundamentals. Okay. Uh, not just on code provisions, but uh, I'm going to focus more on load balancing. Okay. So once you master this technique of load balancing, then uh, the design process would become very, very straightforward. So it is both for statically determinate system as well as for statically indeterminate systems. So just, uh, you know, for the sake of completion, I would just again explain what is the concept of pre-stressing from my perspective, okay? And uh, also, why do we really go for uh, this uh, pre-stressing? I mean, uh, that is another thing. I'm sorry, right? Uh, with three examples, I'll take one with plain concrete and the same plain concrete, if we put axial compression, what happens? And uh, same plain concrete, if I put an eccentric compression, what happens? You know, very simplistic manner. Let us see how this pre-stressing is basically helpful. And of course, you know, uh, I think Professor Dusari also has touched upon what are the advantages of pre-stressing. Uh, in fact, it is a fantastic technique. It uh, uh, it paved the way for a lot of uh, innovations in bridge construction. Um, so I will talk about a little bit from my perspective why uh, that has to be appreciated and uh, load balancing. Like I said, this is one thing that I would focus more on that. And we also have different uh, techniques, like again, uh, what was given in the first lecture, what is pre-tensioning and post-tensioning, different ways of you can, uh, you can achieve the pre-stress in the concrete. Uh, and uh, finally, I'll talk about some remarks on how do we analyze a continuous system? Uh, because you know continuous bridges are not that common in India, but it can be done. And again, it is very, uh, very attractive and uh, very economical as well. So I will talk about that aspect as well. Right. So again, uh, it was explained before, just for the sake of completion. We all know that concrete, uh, you know, is very strong in compression but weak in tension. And usually, tensile strength of concrete is about ten percentage of your compressive strength. And if you look at your modulus of rupture, we take 0.7 square root of FCK, right? So if you take a 40 megapascal strength and if you square root and then take it roughly, it comes around 4 megapascal, 3.8 or so. So it is about 10 percentage. So though it is strong in compression, but it is weak in tension. So that is why we try to reinforce it with steel. But the problem with the reinforcing steel is it is a passive reinforcement. That means it's just going to sit idle 
only when the stress limits are exceeded, then the reinforcement is going to come into picture. Now, I know that the weakness of the concrete is in tension. So, just by playing with applying some stresses, pre induced stresses, can I increase the performance? So uh, I think from 1930s onwards, people have tried, and then you know around I would say 1950s or also it, it was really perfected. And uh, now, as you all know, uh, in the olden days, 30, 40 megapascal itself is considered to be a high strength concrete. Now people are you know 80, 100 is very commonly used in construction, and we are also talking about ultra high performance concrete, which can go as high as 200 megapascal. So. With concrete with such a high strength in compression, can I make it even more efficient? So that is the way the, the, the birth of pre-stressing came into picture. And uh, just by adjusting the amount of compressive stress, I can basically significantly increase the performance. So what we are really doing is that we are putting some kind of a pre-compressive stress in the concrete so that it can take a lot more external load before it can fail. And also from serviceability point of view, we will end up with a crack-free concrete. Okay, again, just for completion, is the olden days people have adopted uh, pre-stressing. Again, you can see here, these are all wooden staves. Uh, basically, it was attached together by force fitting of metal band. If metal band is heated, you know, right? So basically it's going to expand, but then when it comes back to its normal temperature, so it's going to shrink and it is going to hold all these wooden staves in place. So that was used for storing, uh, you know, materials and so on. Because we know that for any uh, material that is storing material, you're going to develop some hoop tension. So by applying pre-compression, you're basically preventing it from opening it up. Again, uh, cylindrical tanks, post-tensioning is possible, circular pre-stressing is possible. And pre-stressing is not only applicable for concrete. In fact, even we can do it for steel. And this is uh, one classical example where you have bicycle spoke. Uh, you know, these spokes, you know, these are all very thin elements, right? So when it is contact with the ground, what happens is these spokes are basically going to be subjected to compression. And as we all know that steel is, though it is, it has high strength in compression and tension, but if you're not careful enough, steel can buckle under compression. So what we really do here is by stretching these spokes, that spokes are going to be always going to be in tension. Okay. So in that way, we can we can enhance the performance of the steel members as well when there is a compression. So pre-stressing is not really applicable only for concrete. In fact, you can do it for any material uh, according to the, uh, the nature of stresses that what we want. Okay. <clears throat> Right again, you know, uh, we, 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 we know that concrete is quite strong in compression and uh, uh, and it is weak in tension. So basically what we are trying to do, if you take a reinforced concrete, of course, like I said, the steel is a passive reinforcement. So when you apply load, you know, you are going to have these kind of cracks. Okay. So in a reinforced concrete, of course, we design the reinforcement considering uh, different limit states. One is a limit state of collapse. We design the reinforcement first for limit state of collapse. Then what we do is we estimate the amount of service loads that are allowable as per the code, whatever the code may be. But then you go ahead and check under service conditions, what are the limits of crack widths and what are the limits for deflections and so on, right? So in reinforced concrete, as you all know that under service loads, usually you, you, you are allowed to have some cracks. Okay, but only thing is we make sure that the crack width is not going to be beyond a certain limit, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3 mm, depending upon the exposure condition of the member, right? So in the same way, you know, now that's the problem is, you know, always, you know, as an architect or a structural engineer, what we really want is we want to span, you know, we want a large column free space. Either you take a bridge, you know, you want to have a longer a span between the piers, or when you look at a, a building, you know, again, we want to have a large column free space. So, but with this material, you know, the longer you go, the moment it cracks, what, uh, what happens is your flexural rigidity, we call that as EI, okay? So EI is a flexural rigidity. That will reduce significantly, okay? And uh, and uh, we know that the curvature is basically M by EI. So for any applied moment, 
when you divide by this flexural rigidity, that is your curvature. So now, for a reinforced concrete, because I am allowing cracking, this I value will not be the entire cross sectional area moment of inertia, right? You are allowing a crack. So, only there is a left out, left out portion which is above the crack, that is what it is effectively resisting the applied flexural load, right? So, you are going to have significant reduction in your flexural rigidity the moment it cracks. Now, what is the significance of that? Now, I have a moment. Now, this M by A is your curvature. So, you're going to have larger curvature because now the A values has come down because of the crack, right? Now, what is the significance of that? Higher the curvature, I mean, curvature is nothing but basically the rotation of the section. The higher the rotation of the section, higher will be the strain in this rebar and higher will be your deflection because deflection is basically double integration of your curvature distribution, right? So, this is the problem with reinforced concrete. The moment I want to go for a longer span, I cannot avoid cracking. I will end up with a lot of deflection. So, that is what I think 1930s people we tried. Okay, I know that it is weak in tension. Can I induce some stresses so that I can keep the concrete happy? When does the concrete is going to be happy? When it is in compression. So, what we do is we take a steel element and imagine the steel as like a rubber band, okay? You stretch the rubber band, right? Steel, rubber band also has an elastic uh, modulus. So in the same way, steel is also having an elastic modulus. So you stretch the rubber band, like the steel, stretch it like a rubber band. And when it wants to come back to its original position, it's going to apply some compression to the concrete, right? So depending upon where I am putting this compression, I can get a lot of stress states. So that is what I think uh, Professor Dosari was talking about, type 1, type 2, type 3, and so on. So that I can control. I can control how much is the P that I can play with, that is the compression, and at what location with respect to the CG of the cross-section, that is your eccentricity of your uh, tendon. Okay? So that is the whole idea. It's because... I know concrete is strong in compression. By putting some stresses, I'm going to make sure that concrete is going to be re remaining predominantly in compression so that it is going to perform to its full advantage. So that is a major idea why we go for. And again, you know, uh, this is again one more thing. You know, of course, because we're inducing stresses opposite to that of external load, I'm going to get some upward deflection, right? And then when the external loads are coming, you're going to have some deflection. This deflection, if I take this as Y, and for reinforced concrete, if I take that as X, and we know that very well that the X is going to be much, much larger than the Y. So that is a basic basic thing. And also, like I said, because we are putting concrete in compression, we are going to have a nice crack-free surface because crack with this, we don't want to have that because corrosion, because we're using steel as a reinforcement. So, and... Uh, the moment you have a lot of crack widths, so you can have chlorides, carbon dioxide, and so on, can get into that, and it can uh, destroy the passive uh, medium around the steel, and the corrosion will start. And a uh, lot of durability issues, because, you know, you know uh, the, this, this thing that you have to always keep in mind, the structures, what we are designing, bridges, you know, if you look at IRC code itself, normal service life is 100 years, okay? And for 100, according to your design requirement, then we need to be really careful about all these aspects. So that's why pre-stressing becomes really, really an attractive option. Uh, one is we want to span for a longer distance and also we want to make it uh, a crack free surface. Again, you know, just a quick uh, history. Uh, I think uh, Professor Bizari did not touch upon that maybe due to lack of time. I will just uh, uh, say it. I think uh, Professor Gustav Magnum. And uh, this is again, you know, it's a very well known example. Again, that Professor Bizari had taken this example of the blocks. Here, you know, uh, this Professor Gustav explained the effect of pre stressing just by holding stack of books. And when you apply compression, then that will take a lot of load. Okay. So basically, what he's doing is he's squeezing it. So it's going to be in compression. So it's going to take a lot of um, loads, external loads. Right. And uh, uh, basically, I think uh, we call for uh, Eugene Fresine as the father of pre stressing. But Gustav Magnell, uh, basically, uh, he uh, propagated the ideas of Fresine 
to the English speaking world. So his contributions are also quite immense. Just a quick uh, history. And uh, we know concrete is in use for, uh, you know, more than 2000 years ago. In fact, Roman concrete is very well known. But the modern concrete, what we call is, because people used to use limestone and all, right? Uh, that started from the invent invention of, uh, you know, Joseph Aspidy. You know, he was the first one to file a patent for manufacture of Portland cement. And then a French florist, you know, what he was doing was he was making flower pots. And when flower pots, you know, you have a lot of mud, what happens is during the uh, storage, you know, it, it starts cracking because it doesn't have any reinforcement. So he introduced a concept of steel wire. So in fact, that was the first documented application of actually using steel to reinforce a concrete. Uh, then, you know, a lot of developments have happened. And then uh, Jackson in the U.S., he introduced the concept of using steel tie rods to tie the artificial stones uh, together. And then uh, Dill, in 1925, he used high-strength unbonded steel rods. See, all these attempts in the er earlier uh, period, it was not really successful because, as explained by the uh, Professor Basari, you know, you have, you have a lot of losses. Though you are, you are, you are stretching the cable and you are locking some stress in the concrete, but the stress is not going to remain constant. So it's going to lose its value over a period of time. And uh, that people did not realize it in the early attempts of processing. So that, uh, you know, created issues. But then uh, Eugene Frazini is also called as father of precious concrete. So he started, you know, uh, he used, basically he realized, okay, there is a loss. So what I really need to do is I need to lock in a lot more uh, compare, you know, uh, uh, stresses means, you know, basically if you look at if I'm using 420 or 415 megapascal, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, it's like a rubber band, right? So if I look at stress strain curve of steel, F, F, FS and F1S, yes, right? So basically, you know, I can go only up to this. I cannot go all the way to the yielding because under the external loads, again, so this is your yield value. So we don't want to go beyond the yield value, right? So always we want, you don't want to stress it all the way to the yield, you know, because of accident loading, again, the rubber band will stretch and then you'll have problem, right? So he understood that concept that though I am locking this stress, stress is coming down. So he said, okay, let me go ahead and use high strength steel so that, you know, he used like at that time itself 1735 megapascal so that he can go up to almost, uh, uh, you know, 1200 stress also. And he also invented this flat jacks and uh, anchorage systems and so on. But then higher, he used this uh, long line method, which is called pre-tensioning method for pre-casting. Because pre-stress and pre-cast, when you use it together, you can you can really develop a lot of wonderful uh, structures. So that's why nowadays pre-cast, pre-stress, concrete construction is quite popular. Right. Again, uh, Professor Gustav Magdal, again, uh, he developed anchoring systems for PT system using flat pages. Again, in India also, we have uh, started using as early as 1940, uh, 40s. And uh, this is again a classical example where there is a Palman Road Bridge, which is a precious concrete bridge. And the first precious concrete bridge in India was built in 1948, which is also called as Assam Rail Link. And uh, uh, this is the bridge, the famous bridge in Assam that was built in 1949. And uh, they had used almost pieces concrete girders of 60 feet and 40 feet spans for the first time. And uh, Gammon India is one of the popular, uh, you know, uh, company. I think John Gammon, again, is also one of the pioneers. He promoted pieces technology in India. And again, this is again a landmark structure, which is an aqueduct, and uh, which is also uh, done using precast segmental construction using match cast. Okay, this is now very quiet popular in segmental constructions. Again, this is a very a nice structure which had both longitudinal precessing as well as transverse precessing and uh, with a span length of 41.5 meter with almost a kilometer of 950 meters. It's quite uh, good and it is in service even now. Right, now let me explain this uh, concept why we really need to go for precessing. Okay, so let's take an example of a beam. I'm taking a cross section of 300 by 500 mm and a length of six meter, and I'm applying a concentrated load right in the mid span. And we know that flexural tensile strength is 0.7 uh, square root of 40 megapascal, and 40, I took it as, uh, in fact, um, yeah, I see 0.7 square root of FCK. Let's let's take FCK as, let's say, 50 megapascal, okay? So if you put that, then you get about 4.94 megapascal as your flexural tensile strength. So if I start increasing the load and we do simple uh, stress checks, we know that 
right, that when this stress at the bottom, when it reaches this magnitude of 4.94, it is going to crack, right? Because in a bending, you're going to have compression at the top and tension at the bottom. And if I take a critical cross section, and you know the bending moment diagram for this, so you know exactly what is the moment at this critical cross section, which is equal to W L by 4, right? So for that W L by 4, which is moment, then I can calculate the stresses in the cross section. So it is plus 4.81 minus. The problem is in using uh, simple bending equations. So I can calculate what is the, uh, because I fix this stress at which it's going to crack. Okay, that is an input parameter. And I fix a section, so I can calculate my section modulus. I multiply with that, and then I get the moment it is going to at which it's going to crack. Once I know the moment at which it's going to crack, I can back calculate what is the load that will induce that crack. So we for, we we do all the simple calculations. We see that it takes only about forty one point one six kilo Okay, so this is just for a plane concrete. Now let's go to the next step. I have basically I've taken same plane concrete beam. Okay, I'm not putting any steel. What I'm really doing is I'm putting some axial compression force. Okay, so there is an axial compression force that I'm putting. So now that axial compression, I'm taking a value of, let's say, 750 kilonewton. Okay, now what is that I'm doing is this axial load is applied along the central line of the cross section of this beam. Okay, so you have concentric precessing, there is no eccentric precessing. So even before any of this, of this W is increased, what I have done is I have applied this stress of P by A. You know the area of the cross section, you divide 750 divided by this area, then you get your compressive stress all along the length of your cross section. Then when you start applying your external load, then you get basically additional stress. So finally, when it will crack, this is a pre-compression. This is your load used due to the external load, which is W. Okay. When you combine them together, the stress at the bottom should reach a tensile strength of 4.94. So again, I create this, I can calculate what is the stress I can allow by increasing the W so that I'll end up with this kind of profile. Of course, in compression also, I have to be careful. But I'm saying that because concrete is strong in compression, then you know compression is usually will not control unless you're you know you're you're, you're dealing with other special cases, right? So again, use the same same basic uh, uh, Bernoulli's bending equation, and then you calculate the cracking. So you see here now the crack has become almost double that that of the previous case. Okay, so you get almost a factor of twice have increased your external load that the particular beam can take. So this is concentric precessing. But I know that with this case, I know that my bending moment is here. So if I can somehow create an eccentric compression, that then it will become even more advantageous and even more economical. So that is what we are going to do here. The third case, same, same section, same beam, same length. Now what I'm doing is I'm just moving this axial compression and I'm putting it at a, some eccentricity with respect to the CG of the cross section, right? So that I'm taking it as a 200. I'm not taking any steel, okay? I just I'm, somehow I'm putting this stress, okay? So if you do the same calculations, again, what we are doing is now this force will have axial component and the moment that will be acting opposite to that of this applied external, right? So you're going to have at the bottom, stress due from axial component, then from an eccentric component, that is a moment, which is moment is nothing but your P times E, P is your force that we have taken, right? So that I have induced basically 12 megapascal. Now, due to external loads, the stress at the bottom has to overcome this 5, overcome this 12, and then take an additional load of 4.94 so that it reaches at the bottom a stress of 4.94. So same compression, just by moving down, now what I'm going to get is a very high load uh, that is going to resist that load. So just by playing with the, the amount of P and the location of P, what I can get is a very good performance. Now you can see here that almost the load for an eccentrically pre-stress concrete section is 4.4 times that of the plane concrete section. And if you compare with the axial one, then it is almost two times, right? So just by varying the eccentric, you know, the compression, I can get a very good performance improvement. So that is the essence of your pre -stressing. Now let us see, okay. And again, you know, like you said, what are the objectives? Why do we really go for pre -stress? Because we want to span the member longer. 
you know, the, like, you know, even in the first lecture, uh, engineer Goel was talking about, right? You have, the, the, if you have a river crossing, of course, you know, you, you know, constructing a pier in the middle of the river will be difficult, right? As much as possible, we want to avoid the number of uh, piers, right? Or columns. So, so when you want to go for a longer span, obviously, you cannot avoid cracking, uh, you know. So, pre-stressing can help to control or eliminate tensile stresses in the cracking, at least up to service loads. At ultimate, you know, it will be, uh, you, you are allowed to have, because ultimate condition will be achieved by a member only at one, one, one point of time, because once it reaches ultimate, it's failure. Right? But the structure is going to see most of them service loads. At service loads, we want to make sure that there is no crack. And also, we want to control that deflections are cracking. Okay, And also, with pre-stressing, what I can do is I can go for using high-strength concrete. In fact, now nowadays, like I said, ultra high performance concrete, people are talking about 200 megapascal. With 200 megapascal, now you combine that with pre-stressing. I can really go and make a very slender and very sleek cross section. In fact, as close as that to that of steel. Okay, steel. The advantage with this is we end up with lightweight sections. But now, if I can create a system that will give you equivalent performance, then I can retain all the advantages of concrete construction. At the same time, I can reduce the self height of your superstructure. So that is a way. Now, a lot of uh, research is going. So again, why uh, we talk about advantage of precious concrete? Again, you know, I have taken you know uh, different examples, same span, same span. You know, for the same load, what we end up with this, we'll have D1 for precious concrete. We'll have depth will be lesser, much lesser than that of what you need for reinforced concrete. And again, if uh, let's say if I'm keeping the same depth, then the load that I can apply in a precious concrete will be much much larger than that of your are a reinforced concrete. That is what we saw in the example before. In fact, I can increase the load by multiple times uh, because what I'm doing is I'm preventing the cracking to happen at a service stage. Again, uh, from durability point of view, again, we don't want to have these kind of cracks. So uh, at service stage, by applying pre-compression, what we can do is we can have a crack-free surface and uh, and we end up with, again, uh, depth will be less, but we end up with basically less maintenance uh, compared to steel and RC. So that is why, in fact, even at ultimate load, you know, you may have cracks even when the loads are going, but it, it will not be that much. In fact, like I said, uh, type 3 members, partially pre-stressed members are also allowed by the code, but the crack widths will be limited compared to that of uh, RC. Then you can go ahead and do an economical design. Again, so there is a difference between how we design the precious concrete and reinforced concrete. In reinforced concrete, what we do is we design for ultimate first limit set of collapse. Okay, then you go ahead and check for service. Okay, in precious concrete, because what we have done is the fundamental premise is, is literally there is no cracking, so the material is going to remain elastic. Okay, so we are going to what we are going to do is we are going to because now what what is a design criteria is basically because we go for a longer span deflection is the deflection is the criteria and stress levels are the criteria uh, that is what in fact even in the first lecture professor Buzari was talking about right the limiting zone so the zone within which I have to place the cable so that the stress levels both on the compression as well as in the tension is going to remain within the limit. Okay, so so in precious concrete, actually we design for serviceability. Then whatever the section, whatever the pieces cable and layout, what we have finalized, we go ahead and check whether it is having adequate strength or not. If it is not having strength, what we do is we we put some uh, non-pre-stressed steel reinforcement and use it. Okay, and similarly because under service load, what happens is in RC you have basically in reinforced concrete your uh, lever arm will nearly remain same. Okay, if load is W1 and W2, if W2, if I'm increasing, if I'm calculating these internal forces, you will find that the lever arm will not change much. Only the internal forces will change. Okay, right. But in, in precious concrete, you will find that the initially, in fact, when there is no load, the C will be at the location of T. Okay, when you increase, you start increasing your, your external load, then the C will start moving away from T. Because what I have done is I have already created a huge, like a rubber band, I have already created a huge force. So the incremental change in your force in the cable under service loads 
because we are talking about merely a crack free section. So that's not going to be significant. So the only way I can achieve the moment is by this, the, 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 this is basically a tuple. So I can achieve the moment only if the basically C moves away from C. So the lever arm is going to be keep changing as a function of your external load. So because this is valid only for under service loads, of course, a lot of redistributions will take once you have cracking and yielding. So it's not really applicable. But having said that, so this is the principle with which we start analyzing the systems. Okay, again, you know, just to the summary, priestess will you will end up with a shallow depth. And for larger spans, you know, uh, priestess concrete most of the time will become mandatory. And uh, because arch kind of systems to put concrete always in compression will become very difficult. And uh, also due to shrinkage and uh, creep or issues also we have to do. And for very large spans, of course, we can go for segmental bridges or cable scale bridges and so on. And uh, the, again, the decks will be using a lot of pieces. So in buildings as well, you know, when we want to have large column free space, then we go for a post tension slabs. Right. Um, again, you know, uh, just, you know, with uh, now nowadays the IRC 112 is allowing this partially pieces section. So it uh, uh, is, is also, you can, you can design uh, an, an economical section. Like I said, again, uh, if, you, if you have to do with RC, then your spans will be limited with priestess. You can go for a really longer spans. So these are all some of the advantages why we go for this. Now I'm going to the, the important aspect is a load balancing concept. If I, in fact, it is also called as equivalent load method. It was, in fact, a very nice method. It was developed by a famous engineer called T.Y. Lin. Okay. And uh, it's a very elegant method. But just to visualize how do we put this pre-stressing uh, cable and the force variation. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, le let's look at this case. Okay. Now, I have this beam, simple beam. First, let me start with statically determined system. It's a simply supported beam. And if I know that I'm going to have this kind of, a, um, let's say, imposed load distribution, let's say that I'm going to have a very heavy point load that is coming. Okay. Now, for this system, we know that the bending moment profile is basically WL by 4 like this, right? Okay. So, so the cable profile also should basically mimic that because wherever tension is there, that's where you need to put your steel. This precessing steel is also steel. It is also going to take additional tension that is going to come from your external loads. But what we really do here is by stretching this cable and anchoring them, what we are really looking, though the cable is in tension, the effect of this cable pre-stressing on the concrete is going to be like this. So it's going to be in compression. Okay, this is going to be in compression. Now at this point, if you just look at the free body diagram of the concrete, okay, so the concrete will be subjected to at this point, basically uh, a force like this, you know, depending upon the inclination of your cable. So this portion. So what you will have is if I resolve this component, I'm going to have a horizontal component that is compression and a vertical component. Because now you have to look at what is the effect of this tension on the concrete. Because right, the cable will be in tension, but the concrete, if you just look at the free body diagram at this location, so you have an inclined cable like this, right? So if you resolve that, that effect is going to be acting towards, it's going to compress the concrete. So you're going to have horizontal component and a vertical component. So this horizontal component is going to squeeze the concrete and the vertical component is basically going to lift the concrete up. Okay. We have is a, you know, we can also, when you have a imposed load is uniformly distributed load, we can also uh, create a vertical component, which is basically uniform uh, as well. Okay. Just by having a parabolic cable put there. This, the vertical load that what I'm going to create uplift, it is directly proportional to the slope change of the cable profile. Okay. Here you have a linear cable profile. So the slope of this cable is changing only at this point. Okay. So if I know this theta and if I know this theta, so basically you'll have basically two P sine theta. That would be the force that will be coming here. Okay. And... Uh, and horizontal component, what it does is basically it is going to squeeze the concrete in compression. That is going to give me a good improvement in your, uh, because you're going to lock uh, 
compressive stresses on the tension side due to the external load. Uh, so you're going to get. But this vertical component, what it will do is it will basically nullify the effect of your uh, imposed load. So, so that is a beauty. So with pre-stressing, what I can do is by controlling the cable profile, I can really design depending upon what load that I'm seeing. So you must have all seen in podium slabs, you have huge uh, floating columns that will come and then it does to transfer the load. In that kind of system, the only way you can take care of all the load is by having a transfer girder with a post-tensioning cable that will basically relieve some of the load that is coming from this floating column. Right. So now let us look at see this 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 equivalent load is a very very elegant and very interesting concept. Uh, let's uh, take again a linearly varying cable profile, and this is your pre-stressing strand. Now I'm looking at only you know I'm anchoring this at the end, right? So it's going to squeeze the concrete in compression in this direction, though the cable will be in tension. Okay, so the cable will always be in tension, but we have to see what is the effect of cable on the concrete. Okay, so the concrete will be on the compression. So if I just take a simple, if I take this uh, concrete member and assume this as a line diagram, okay, and I am looking at these forces, what the cable is inducing, you will find that you have horizontal component that is P cos theta, and you have vertical component that is P sin theta. And because of the, the slope is changing here, you will get two P sin theta components. So then what I create is, now you can see these reactions and loads are exactly opposite to that of what we are going to get from your external loads, right? So you get a bending moment like this, which is exactly going to be opposite to that of, opposite to that effect of your, your external loads. Now, same thing can be done for your parabolic cable also. Now, if you see this, now if you see here, parabolic cable, right? It's a second degree. Parabola equation is second degree. So when I change it, the slope is basically every point the slope changes constant, right? So that is why you get a nicely uniformly distributed vertical load. Again, but in this anchorage point, you will get same horizontal component, vertical component. And then when you look at the bending moment diagram, nicely you get this parabolic bending moment diagram which is basically going to be in the opposite direction to that of your external load. So with this vertical component, what I can really create is, I can really create you know, the member to be not feeling any stress. So if I just uh, play with this P uh, uh, for force, uniformly distributed load, now I can come up with this structure that is not going to feel any stress from external load. That is possible. Okay, so that's the beauty of pre-stressing. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in designing the system. Now let us look at the same. I'm taking the same um, the parabolic uh, cable profile tendon. And if you look at the what is the effect on the concrete, again, we are resolving it to P cos theta and P sin theta. Now let us take, you know, you take a 500 mm girder and the eccentricity of cable profile is, let's say, about uh, 300 mm. Okay, and uh, you are taking a 10 meter girder. So what would be the maximum slope of this cable? You, you look at at least half the way, five meter, and you have an eccentricity of, let's say, 300 mm. So 300 mm divided by five meter, that is 5,000 mm. So if you see here, that slope is going to be very, very gradual because the members, what we are dealing with is quite long. So if you resolve this, then, so what I'm trying to say here is the theta would be very, very small, okay? And uh, so you know that when theta becomes small, P cos theta can be approximated to basically P and P sine theta can be approximated to P theta, right? So that is what we really do. We try to, for small angles at what we are creating because our members are quite long, you create a horizontal component as effective as that of your horizontal component and you also get a vertical component which is P theta. So now what I can do, I get, I have, P to play with, I have theta to play with, and I can also change this theta wherever I want, depending upon what load I have. So, restressing gives you a lot more flexibility in your design. So, that is the beauty of restressing. Now, let us look at again some more examples. Uh, we looked at uh, linearly varying cable. Now, I'm having a cable that is at an eccentricity, just like, you know, now you have a reinforcement that is creating this force. In the first example, I said, I just took this P. I didn't tell you how this uh, P was basically produced. But okay. So this is the example where you have an eccentric cable. Profile. Now you look at it. Now at the end moments, what I have really created is, if you create again, if you take the concrete and you take that as a line element and you put the forces equal in system of forces, I'm going to have P. Now, this is going to be a moment that is acting in this right support in a 
clockwise direction, so that is P. So I have created a concrete because of the pre-stressing, a nice kind of this kind of an equivalent load system. So now I'm going to have a moment that is constant along the length of the member. Okay. So, you know, just by varying this cable profile, again, you can, again, this is a more practical case. Now what I have done is I've taken the eccentricity of the cable at the support to the above the CG of the cross section, above the C, right? So now what I have created is at the end, I'm having moment, okay, which is equal to P times E. Now, again, I will have a P cos theta and I will have P sin theta. Everything is there. Of course, theta is small. We can approximate P cos theta as P, P sin theta as P, uh, sorry, P theta, right? So you can, you can, you'll have one more moment as well. So you create this kind of moment. This is a common profile that I can create for a continuous system where you're going to have moment at the both ends, right? So depending upon what kind of system that we have, I can play with the profile of the cable to create a moment that is going to oppose the uh, the external loads effectively. So that is the whole idea. Now, again, we look at it, you know, in a simplistic case. Again, uh, we, we for small angles, we did that. And then, you know, this is again, you know, uh, this is just one example, you know, if your P is basically everywhere along the CG of the cross section, then you will find that moment from pre-stressing is basically, yeah, all of them will basically, you know, uh, a counterbalance each other, then you will find that there is no pre-stressing moment. So you have to be really, really careful what is the effect of pre-stressing on the overall structural member. Again, now let us look at, uh, you know, how to get this again, you know, we looked at it, how we, we, we looked at it, right? So this is now for this cable profile, uh, could you guess what is the load distribution that you'll have? This is basically a load distribution for two point loads that are acting at L3 and L3. Right. So, like I said, the bending moment, the cable profile should basically mimic what is the moment that is going to uh, be produced by the external load. So, if I'm choosing this cable profile, that means that I have two point loads that are acting. Now, I'll tell you why that is done. Because if you look at the cable again, L third, right? So, this if I if I can calculate the theta. So, if I know the depth of the cable profile, I can calculate the theta, right? So that theta is basically, let's say that this uh, eccentricity of the cable is E naught. So basically theta is going to be three E naught by L or E naught by L, L third. So you'll get that, right? Now, if you look at the free body diagram of only cable, okay? Now I'm taking only cable. Now cable is in tension. Now this system has to be, you know, in equilibrium. So what the concrete will do is, concrete will try to push the cable, right? So if you look at this, so this is the cable profile, but we are, we are looking at what is the effect of this cable on the concrete, right? So if you look at the effect of the concrete on the cable, this is going to be this F and F has to be in equilibrium. So it's going to push the concrete up, right? So that is what we are going to create. This F, we can calculate what is the F, which is basically proportional to the slope change. It will be P, uh, theta. So the theta is P. So at the end, what you will have is a horizontal component will be P, and the vertical component, because of theta, we, we found that P cos theta, P sin theta, because theta is very small. So I can approximate this as P and vertical component as P theta, right? And at this point, because there is a slope change, this F also is going to act on the concrete. Again, mind you, we are looking at what is the force system that is on the concrete. Cable will be still be in tension, right? So this way we can do it. Again, this is again another, uh, uh, the more common case. Uh, if you look at the parabolically varying cable, if I take a, take a very small uh, uh, an elemental length, let's say delta x, and if I look at the free body diagram of the cable, again, the cable is going to be in tension. Now, if you look at this cable, will also be subjected to a pressure from concrete because it's all connected together, right? So it's going to see that force, right? And uh, if, if I draw a tangent at this point and this point, we know the difference between them is basically your slope change. So mind you, again, we are taking at an elemental length delta x. The slope change between these two points is delta theta, right? So if you if you have that, and then if you draw the force simple force triangle, right? You have p p, and it does to be in equilibrium. So then I can find an expression for your delta f in terms of p and theta. Okay. Again, one more way we can do it is if I've taken, uh, uh, now the curvature is basically the slope change per unit length. So the curvature is nothing but this delta theta divided by delta x. So if you look at it, again, the delta f is basically p times your delta theta. 
if I take, if I want to calculate the force per unit length, then delta F will be need to be divided by delta X. So if you divide by that, that would become basically your uh, equal and load per unit length, which is basically P into delta theta by delta X, which is nothing but your curvature of your cable profile. Now I said it's a parabolic cable profile. The curvature change is going to be uniform, right? Or the slope change is uniform. It's a, so that is why we create a, a force equivalent load W due to pre stress in the upward direction, okay? Because this delta F, you are looking at the cable. Now, if I'm looking at the concrete, this delta F is going to be act up, okay? So that, that we are not looking at delta F, we are looking at delta F by delta X. So that is your WP, right? So that is basically is proportional to the precessing force and the curvature of the cable profile. So if you know the slope change of the cable, I can calculate what is the, the vertical uplift force that is produced by the pre-stress. So that is the whole idea, right? Again, you know, this can also be derived, you know, if you find an equation for your cable profile as a parabola, and uh, if you know your dip of your cable profile from this, from simple parabolic equation, I can calculate the slope of the profile and also I can calculate the curvature of the cable profile. You will find that the curvature will be equal to eight times E max by L square. Okay. So that is basically your traditional, your uh, uh, same. So when I multiply, what is that uh, vertical force basically is basically, which is basically P times this, P times eight. Uh, WP is nothing but curvature times your uh, P, right? So you multiply by that, then you become WP will become 8 P E max by L square. So that is what we get. And you get your force like this, which is force per unit length. Okay. So this is your uh, forces that are acting on the concrete due to pre stress alone. So I can. How do I increase the WP? Again, I can increase it by increasing the P or increasing the curvature of the cable. How do I increase the curvature again? I have to provide more E for a particular length, right? So in that way, by choosing the cable profile and the amount of processing force, I can create a nice uniformly distributed load that is going to act exactly opposite to that of what we are going to get in external load, right? So that is how we get it. Again, just a quick example. Uh, I take a 8.5 meter span with a load of 70 kilonewton meter, and I've chosen a cable profile like this. And the section is basically 400 by 800. Yeah. And uh, if you look at, you know, uh, the section at the end, you have basically it's going, and there is no eccentricity at the end because, you know, simply supported, no moment has to be there. And at the mid span, you have a, a high max max, right? So from the expression that what we have created, derived, we can calculate WP 66.4 kilometers. So you see here, by creating a, four, a cable profile with a processing force of 2000 kilonewton, what I have really created is an upward load of 66.4 kilonewton meter, which is almost equal to that of your 70 kilonewton meter. So by choosing the processing force and the cable profile, I can actually now, what is the load that it's, uh, the beam is going to see? It is basically going to see a residual load of 70 minus 66.4. So it is going to see only 3.6 kilonewton per meter. So that moment is what will induce stresses because now I have already balanced the external load that is coming on the system. So that is the uh, beauty of this. Then you, if you calculate the stresses, now you see that uh, the concrete, the entire cross section is nicely in compression because concrete likes compression. There is no problem, no cracking. In fact, you know, even at the bottom, you see here, concrete is still in compression of minus performance. In fact, that can lead to problem also. Okay. What is the problem here? If you see here, because of this, I've created it, uh, you know, uh, if I, if I'm not careful enough, what I can do is I can also create too much compression at the top, which is also not correct. Okay. So in processing, that is one thing that we have to be careful because uh, you have to create stresses where you want. If you're not careful enough, then you may put uh, more compressive stress at the locations where you really don't need it, right? So we have to do that. Again, you know, types of pre-stressing, yes. Okay, I have about uh, 40 minutes or so. Let me uh, speed up. Uh, I think uh, I think classifications were done already. So uh, I think the most important thing is, you know, most of the time we use hydraulic pre-stressing. In the olden days, people use chemical pre-stressing as well and mechanical pre-stressing and so on. Uh, we do hydraulic systems of pre-stressing. 
Uh, we have two types of system that was already explained, pretension and post-tension. Just quickly, uh, you know, in pretension, what we do is we stress the cable before and then we pour concrete. Once the concrete hardens, then you release the stress and then you create in post-tensioning. What we do is we create a duct inside the, uh, uh, the concrete member and then we thread these tendons through and then we stress them. The advantage with post-tension system is I can apply a large amount of pre-stressing force. Uh, but there is also disadvantages uh, that we that we will see. Uh, just a quick example of what happens uh, in pre-tensioning method. Uh, what we do is tendons and reinforcements are positions in the mold and stage two, they are stressed about 70% of their ultimate strength and then concrete is cast. And then when the concrete is cured, then basically you cut the tendon. So because already the bond has been formed, now it's going to squeeze the concrete and it is going to lift the beam up. So you're going to have a camber. So that is pretension. It's a, it's a very attractive system for producing precast systems uh, because precast and precast when combined together, we can really make a lot of uh, good products which can serve the needs. And in post tensioning, like I said, we create this opening, right? And we thread these cables through and then we stress them and then you know it's a self anchoring system because you're jacking against the concrete itself so you can and when you do it basically you your concrete will have a lot of high strength so you can really apply a large amount of pre stress into it and again uh, post tensioning can be two things one can be a um, unbonded system or a bonded system in india as well as in asia uh, i would say uh, Bonded systems are quite uh, popular. Having said that, unbonded systems also uh, have been used in uh, some applications. Again, pre-tensioning, it is suitable for making large amount of products. You know, all the precast factories, you, if you go, I think they will have this long line method of producing. In fact, it was uh, developed by Hire. It's also called as Hire's uh, uh, long line method of uh, uh, producing the mass production of precast systems using pre-stressing. Right, I think uh, just quick, uh, you know, I just you see you can see that this anchoring system. We put this is and run the cable and we stress them, and this is also we call this as a bulkhead or anchoring head, and we stress them. And uh, and pretension systems are always bonded, and uh, it because it allows uh, uh, protects the tendon from corrosion. It allows for direct transfer of tension. And uh, also, you know, one, one thing is for pre-tension system, you need this kind of a stout anchoring systems. In fact, uh, you can go for a long line. In fact, 200, 300 meter casting yards are also possible. And you can you can make a product for the entire loop. And this is just uh, one uh, figure from, I think, courtesy from Professor Sridharan. You can see almost a 90 meter long girder and the depth is as high as three meters have been uh, cast using pre-tensioning method. Only problem is transporting these kind of long girders is an issue, right? Wherever it is possible, in fact, there is no restriction on the length of precast or pre-tension product that we can make. Only thing is the hauling and placing them transportation is an issue. Again, how do we create this change in cable profile? We do this kind of a vertical harping or we use is also called harping of the thing. So you have vertical jacks that is going to hold this cable at a particular location to create that uh, a cable profile that what we want. And uh, this, uh, the bottom location, these uh, cables will be held. Okay, These are called deviators so that these cables which are there in this previous hole, you know, you see this vertical ones. These are also pre-stressing cable that will be held uh, by the bottom anchors like this. So they are also called as hold downs so that you can maintain the cable profile according to what you want. Again, these are all some of the pictures you can see it's quite, uh, you know, we can create a nice, uh, you know, you can clearly see here, you have a linear cable profile. So that means that this girder is going to receive two huge point loads. That's why they've chosen this kind of a cable profile. Again, post tension system, you have internal PT and external PT. And internal PT, uh, you have bonded systems and unbonded systems. In external PT, mostly they are unbonded. And uh, like I said, we have different systems that are possible depending upon what you're looking at, uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can choose. Um, in bonded means basically what we do is once we thread these tendons, we grout them and you have a nice compatibility between the surrounding concrete and the tendon. In case of an unbonded system, you have compatibility between the concrete and the steel pre-tension, uh, sorry, uh, the post-tension steel happens only at the anchoring points. In between, they are basically, they are not connected together, okay? So, an external PD is, you know, always unbonded only. 
And again, uh, like I said, in bonded tension, post tension girders are very common uh, because we can go for a large amount of processing force. And finally, we we grout the system using a nice grout. You can see that the grout also should satisfy a lot of requirements because if you're not grouting them properly, then you may end up corroding that uh, steel. Where then you know that is also not correct. Like again, I said, bridges are designed for hundred years, so. Uh, the system has to be really uh, good for 100 years. Um, if you're not careful, in fact, you may end up. So these are some of the pictures uh, from Engineer Vinay Gupta. In, in his, one of his presentation, he showed that uh, if you if you're not careful enough, these tendons, you can see these are some of the, the samples that were cut, and then they looked at it. You can see that, you know, and also you can send some, uh, you know, camera and look at what is happening. So, you know, if it is not done properly, then it'll start corroding. And you can clearly see here that the ducts were not really uh, grouted well in this case. Okay, <clears throat> so most of the time for a longer girders, we try to provide this air vent when we are grouting so that, uh, you know, we make sure that, uh, you know, the complete uh, cable is grouted nicely. Again, unbonded tendons are also quite, you know, in fact, in the, in the US, uh, in the North America, I should say, unbonded systems are quite, quite, quite popular. Uh, the, the advantage with the unbonded system is you can restress it and uh, if there is a loss in stress, for example, or you want to go for additional uh, force, then we can do that. But in case of a bonded system, because you are directly bonded to the concrete, that kind of restressing is not possible. So these are some of the advantages with unbonded system. And I will also show you some of the slides. Uh, what are the difference in terms of design aspects? Okay, uh, from allowable stresses point of view, absolutely there is no difference. Uh, but for resisting the ultimate moment, sometimes what we do is the code will mandate you to put some uh, rebar, non-priestess steel wheel bar. So in case of a bonded system, we end up with providing less non-priestess steel. Uh, but in case of an unbonded system, we, you know, we want to be a little bit more careful because in the event, if the unbonded cable is somehow, if it is failing, still the system should at least hold together until we go on intervening. So uh, the non-priestess steel requirements in case of an unbonded system is a little bit on the higher side. And the shear, absolutely there is no difference. And uh, similarly, for bonded beams and slabs, uh, you know, there are no minimum requirements. Again, like I said, what are the difference between bonded and unbonded PT systems? In bonded piece, uh, pieces, if you, let's say if I take a beam that is subjected to a you know, point load here, the same beam with a point load. Now, what we are saying here is you have every location section, I say the steel is nicely bonded to concrete. Here, the steel is connected to concrete only at the ends, right? So if you look at the concrete strain location, you will you will concrete will basically undergo strain as proportional to that of your um, the bending moment problem. Now this strand I have already locked in an initial strain that is epsilon p naught. Okay, after some losses. Okay, the strand will basically then you know the difference in strain will add up to that. So the strand at the mid span will have a strain of a strain in the concrete at that location plus epsilon p naught. But if you look at, in case of an unbonded system, the, 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 the strain, you have to look at it from only from deformation compatibility because the strand is not really bonded to the concrete. So only the deformation, the entire stretching of this uh, strand and the stretching of the uh, beam or deformation of the beam has to be same, right? So only deformation compatibility can be uh, ensured. Okay, so if you calculate from that principle, what is the average strain, you will find that the concrete strain is going to be relatively smaller compared to that of what you have for a bonded system. So in essence, what we are saying here is this is a delta strain, okay, at the level of steel. The total strain that is possible is going to be lesser in case of an unbonded system compared to a bonded system. So, if total strain is lesser means the stress also is going to be lesser. So the moment resistance is also going to be lesser when you have an unbonded system because you are, you are ensuring the strain compatibility only in an average sense, not at every, every location, right? Okay, now then why we really, you know, worry about this unbonded system and eccentric tendons? If you go for an internal processing or a bonded system, so this is the maximum eccentricity that I can get. Okay, if I go for an external processing, of course, the tendons have to be kept outside that is accessible, right? So you kept it in the box girder, you know, inside, right? So what happens is this eccentricity that is available, okay, is going to reduce compared to that of 
internal or bonded system. So you end up providing more um, processing force to reach your design requirement. Okay. Now people are talking about, okay, let me take advantage of this external system. Wherever I need, what I do is I go ahead and put outside the, uh, the member itself. And then I get a very large extension because mind you, uh, again, you know, the force and the strength is proportional to your processing force times how far it is away from your CG. Okay. Or I should say this is center of gravity of the section, uh, not the strand. Okay. So this is E3. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> so externally uh, post tension concrete bridges, you can end up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this case, you, when I compare this and this, you will get, but, you know, highly eccentric, you know, if I go with this, then I get a very sleek member and I get a good system. Okay. Because again, uh, you know, with the ordinary external tendon, what we can do is we just put it inside this uh, box girder like this. You know, of course, the profile of the tendon should follow the profile of the bending moment that we are going to get. But however, if I can create a system that can hold this tendon like this, then what I can do is the moment is basically pre-stressing moment is proportional to P times the E. So I get a very large moment. So I can get a, compared to this section, if you see, I end up with a sleeker section. That means less depth. So it is very, very attractive. So people have also done that. And uh, again, like I said, how do we choose this? You know, if you choose an external uh, tendon layout in proportion to your bending moment, then you will you will get a very, very good economic and efficient design. So by going with this highly eccentric tendon, we can end up with lightweight structures because the girder height can reduce and we can also effectively use materials. And we also have flexibility in design to suit various site conditions. So this is one of the bridge that is the uh, Simazaki River uh, and they have uh, constructed this pedestrian bridge. You can see here the cable that is going below and you have this meta metal arrangements that can help the cable to maintain its profile. Then it goes to the support. You see here the cable goes. So this looks like a fin for a fish. Okay. So you can also design the system to be aesthetically uh, pleasing as well. So people have done that. Now, again, uh, technical aspects, like I said, you know, bonded and unbonded system. Okay. We can, we can go for a more stress compared to that of an unbonded system because you're ensuring strain compatibility. Okay. And in unbonded system, deformation compatibility is satisfied only at the member level. However, in a bonded system, you have strain compatibilities, uh, uh, you know, in unbonded system, it is not satisfied. Uh, so unbonded systems are somewhat less effective if you compare the similar uh, systems. Okay. But however, like if I unbonded system gives me flexibility of increasing the eccentricity to the level what I want. Okay. Again, just a quick example of, uh, you know, two systems. One is with the bonded tendon and one is another unbonded tendon. You will find that, you know, the moment capacity, what I can realize is going to be slightly higher in case of a bonded system than in case of a, and of course here, mind you, the, the tendons are basically within the cross section. It's not a highly eccentric tendon, right? So, so in that case, then your reinforcement requirement also in case of there, you know, you will find that, you know, of course, uh, in the post tensioning cable, we need to put a lot of this uh, spirals and all to avoid the bursting tension stresses and so on. Right. So slightly the reinforcement requirement for a similar uh, members, it is going to be higher in case of system. Again, how do we analyze this for flexure? Again, you know, I, I, I will, I'll talk about this, you know, when we do the example. Uh, just again, fundamental concepts uh, are still uh, well valid. That means we use strain compatibility approach. And uh, only thing what we are doing is we, we have to consider this initial locking strain that we are doing because we are stretching the uh, cable, processing cable, and we are locking in some strain, initial strain. And now when the concrete or the section is undergoing strain due to external load, this is the strain profile that you have. However, you need to consider this strain plus this addition strain as a total strain that you have it on the uh, piece of system. Then your, you, you, you satisfy your force equilibrium and you can quickly calculate your uh, moment resistance. For This is for ultimate condition. Okay? We can also do a detailed moment curvature analysis and so on using first principles. One thing we have to note down here is, I think uh, this I should uh, highlight. If you are looking at an ordinary non pre stressed deformed steel rebar. And we know that the advantage with this system is though it is having 500 megapascal, 
it will go almost you know it reaches yield and you get a little bit of strain hardening and so on but you know it goes as high as 16 to 18 percent strain okay when you are using a non precess steel however the moment you go for high strength high priest you know precessing strand you will find that you get stress because of the manufacturing process however what you lose is a ductility it usually fails about 5 to 6 percentage so you get strength but you lose ductility this aspect we have to be really uh, consider that in our design so the code gives you some limitation that's why code always uh, will limit your precessing steel in such a way that an ultimate condition the steel will still yield give you warning before concrete fails in compression right again these are some of the uh, post tensioning how do we do again in post tensioning you know like i said a single cable can be run through the entire length of the thing and you can do the jacking however losses are very important factors that we have to keep in mind because the losses in post tension system this cable because it's running through the duct that is going to basically uh, it's going to basically move against the surface of the duct and you're going to generate a lot of friction so in the whole process you will have you will you lose a lot of precessing force uh, in a post tension cable due to friction and also because of the curvature the moment you have the post tension cable having a lot of curvature you can you know in fact uh, if you are stretching from stressing from only one side you can uh, lose your stress as high as 30 percentage okay so that is why typically what we do is we try to stress it from alternate ends so that your average loss is within the acceptable limit so we do uh, stressing in uh, multiple directions okay depending upon uh, your uh, requirement that you have and we also in post tensioning we have to be really really careful okay like i said you know the cable change right the, the slope change will produce this uplift or a down uh, or a pushing force downward if you are not careful about the position of your ducts then you can create uplift or a downward force you know which is not really required if you create this is the correct layout right at the mid span you know we want to lift the beam up because it's going to due to external load is going to deflect but at the support we are going to lift it up so that negative moments can be reduced however if you are not careful you can also create so post tensioning you have to be really really careful about what kind of uh, stresses that you are inducing right so again uh, pre, pre cast pre tension you can also slicing is also possible in post tensioning as well and we can uh, do the slicing for uh, you know uh, transporting you know because transporting a large girder may not be possible so spliced girders are also commonly used in constructions and one thing in post tensioning cable again what you have to be careful is this eccentricity because you are talking about you know 19 uh, seven wire spans like that you know you have bundle of these spans will be bundled together as a cable okay so you have huge number of cable that are there as a stands as a part of the cable right so that is what we have seen so you have tendon sizes you know it's taken from collins and mitchell you can see that sheath diameter can vary from 32 to 140 millimeter okay so depending upon number of strands that you are going to put you can see here number of half inch strands varies from 3 to almost 55 strands also you can accommodate so when you have such a large duct your tendency at the mid span will be the ex the cable will start moving upward so you start losing some eccentricity in the whole process and similarly at the support also the you know if, you, if your strands are upward then it is beneficial you get higher extension but the tendency of the cables would be always to go downward at the support so you lose extension these kind of corrections also we have to especially when you go for this kind of a, a large duct and with large precessing force even a small reduction in eccentricity will play a major role so that we have to be careful about again uh, post tensioning is also used for structural strengthening of course it's not related to bridges even bridge uh, for structural strengthening we we adopt this post tensioning and this is uh, some of the uh, examples and we have again uh, you have a large uh, waterline pipe again you know when you have a fluid that is or a liquid that is going so it's going to induce some foot tensile stresses uh, we can improve the performance by doing this circumferential pre-stressing in the form of a post-tension system 
again again this is also segmental construction again you know uh, it's very commonly used and this is the example for the external pt that i said and it's not a highly eccentric tendon so this has been you know used within the uh, the box section itself uh, like i said the one of the disadvantages because you lose a little bit of eccentricity that is possible and a lot of uh, bridges have been constructed using both the external as well as pieces again in tendons you you have you know uh, different kind of systems you have individual strands then you finally grout it or you have the individual strands themselves they come with a plastic sheet strand so of, of course this type 2 is uh, costlier than the type 1 system and nowadays the most common one is this uh, type 2 system again external system again for buildings again external post tensioning is very common used for structural strengthening you can run these cables and you can create this uplift force you know uh, and then so you can you can basically reduce the deflection so you have to be careful a little bit about material aspects i think you know it was touched upon briefly uh, i maybe i'll highlight one more aspect uh, most of the time in pre stressing like i said the earlier attempts of pre stressing were not successful because the the locked in pre stress or stretching was not remaining the same mainly because of two effects one is the creep another one is the relaxation and creep why does the all materials creep but concrete creeps uh, little higher okay so uh, why the creep happens is because we use uh, water uh, for hydration process and for workability but actually for complete hydration of cement you need uh, about 0.15 to 0.18 or 0.2 max but we end up providing much larger than water cement ratio if you look at it right much larger water cement ratio than what you really need uh, however you know in the modern day we have admixtures that are available uh, that that is helping but if your water that is sitting uh, ideal what will happen is it will try to escape out of the system so what will happen is the strains will keep increasing over a period of time though your elastic strain or due to stress application may be certain magnitude but over a period of time this will keep increasing so that is what we said flow creep coefficient is usually taken as a total strain divided by this elastic strain which gives you a measure of how much the material uh, is, uh, is is going to undergo strain right and factors affecting too because we need to offer, cure the concrete well so that the uh, water that is there uh, that is effectively utilized and uh, temperature also is going to uh, higher the temperature higher will be the creep so these are all the points that we need to be careful uh, while we design it we have to account for it most of the time what we do is we go for a lump sum loss uh, but there are some procedures that are available for detailed calculation of uh, all these aspects again larger members with the large volume to surface area usually will have less tendency to creep because you have uh, less surface area compared to the volume for the water to escape because when the water is escaping the volume is shrinking right so that is what it is creating creep again this was also explained uh, previously maybe i will not spend time on this one thing the creep does is you know what happens is it softens the concrete again when your elastic modulus of the concrete is reducing what happens is you know you, you lose the stiffness of the member because the flexural stiffness is again ei by l so e when it is reducing then you start losing so you will end up with more deflections right so that you have to basically account for them in your design again various types of steels are available i, I think uh, that was mentioned so uh, against uh, different types of uh, precessing steels are added most of the time you know commonly we use is a low relaxation strand and relaxation is also basically uh, uh, it's basically at a Uh, you lose the effective strain okay you stretch it at a point you keep, try to in, in a precessing system what we do we stretch the cable like a rubber band and we keep it at a position but however the tendency for the tendon to remain at the same strain will not be there over a period of time the strain will get reduced the effective strain that what we are locking that will keep reducing uh, that we need to account for them in us because that strain is reducing obviously the stress that you are inducing on the concrete is also going to reduce over a period of time so that we need to account for them in design so we have different types of strands strands that are available and usually we go for low relaxation strand again this aspect i spoke to you uh, already uh, with high strength steel we have to be careful we lose the ductility or the strain at which it's going to fail is going to be much much uh, in fact one third of what you get for a deformed reinforcing bar so the ductility you are losing so when you are using high strength material you have to be really really careful because the failure can be brittle if you are not careful 
So that is another aspect that we need to be careful in using. Again, relaxation, we talked about it. Again, the same effect like that of creep, what it will do is it will soften the steel. So what we are really doing here is I'm keeping it at a particular strain, right? So now at that particular strain, the stress will cause starts coming down. So basically your 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 elastic effective elastic modulus of the strand is reducing. Or in other words, your effective stress is also going to be reduced. Okay. So this is the initial stress due to relaxation, it will come down. So a lot of uh, tests have been done uh, by subjecting the strand to uh, this is like if the by locking them to particular strain and then they observe how much is the stress that is left. Okay. What they found is if your initial strain is much lesser than that of your yield strain, uh, okay, then the relaxation losses are less. Okay. So the, anyway, the code IRC code 112 or if you're doing a building design IS1343 gives you values for approximate values for how to account for this thing. But you have to be careful. Uh, those have limits. If you're using a new system, then we need to test it and quantify what is the relaxation loss. Again, you know, with losses, again, one point what I would like to uh, highlight is exact determination of losses is difficult because creep will affect relaxation, relaxation will affect creep. They're all interdependent. So exact determination is very difficult. That is why codes also allow you to go for a lump sum loss in your calculations. At the same time, if you start underestimating the loss, then what you do is you think that you have put a lot more pieces but actually the pieces will not be there. So finally you'll end up with deflection and cracking, which you don't want. At the same time, if you overestimate the loss, what you'll do is you will, you will apply more precessing force, but then you will basically uh, may, may uh, fail the concrete by uh, failing in compression. So that is also an issue. So we have to uh, really take a uh, engineering judgment on what would be the, uh, but we have detailed procedures for calculating in an accurate way also losses. All right, so now I think I will take 10, 15 more minutes for continuous systems. Uh, okay. And that is also very important. And how we deal with continuous systems, then I'll close the presentation. Again, continuous systems are very advantageous because it's a statically indeterminate system. So you can end up with a very economical design and deflections are going to be less. And you end up with, you provide alternate load paths so with a lot of redundancy. And also, when you go for continuous precess systems, we need only a less number of anchorages, right? So that means for bridges, we end up with a less number of deck joints and bearings are reduced and reduced to maintenance. These are all some of the advantages for going for a continuous system. However, you have a lot of uh, things. You have something called secondary effects or hyperstatic effects uh, that will come into picture because the system is not really statically determinate. So when you pre-stress them, the supports are preventing the member to undergo, uh, you know, camber, right? So what you re really do is you're creating additional loads uh, that we need to account for them in design. And it is also difficult to construct, especially depending upon the sites, especially using precast systems. Uh, and uh, when you go for a very long beam, I, I have told you frictional losses in post tension system is quite high. And it is just proportional to the how much is the curvature change that is happening from one end to another end. So you may end up with a very large uh, frictional loss. And uh, also, you, you, if you're not careful, if you're doing an integral system, of course, you may end up with the shortening and uh, you create additional lateral force on the supporting columns. And again, secondary stresses will develop due to creep, shrinkage. But if you're if you're careful enough, then we really design it properly, then we can really end up with a very good economical uh, system. Now, the concept is very simple. I talked to you about the equivalent load or a load balancing concept. Even in a continuous system, this is the, the you know, the elegance of uh, the approach that was produced or proposed by T.Y. Ling. In any continuous system, if you look at it, you know, we try to, like I said, you know, this is a two span with the overhang. And we know that for an uniformly distributed load, this is the moment profile that you're going to take. Right? So we want to choose a cable profile close to that of your bending moment profile. And we are going to have negative moment at the support, positive moment at the mid span, because the end support, I don't have any moment. So this is the cable profile, ideal cable profile for a, this kind of a system. Now, how do I calculate this P? Or for a P, uh, 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 how do I choose what is the equivalent vertical load that I can put on a system? Okay. Let's say I want to balance this 
downward load by an equivalent load due to pre stress. So, how we really do here is for example, in this case, if you know the eccentricity of the cable profile, at the moment at this location is going to be T times E. And uh, so that is a cantilever, right? a cantilever moment. So that is going to be W S by the 2. So that you equate it and you calculate what is the W1 that you can produce. In case of an intermediate, this span, we call this as a drape. So what is a drape? I draw a line from this tip point to this point. What is the maximum dip that is possible is what we call as a drip. So in this case, I have an eccentricity at this cable support of E1 and this location of E3 and mid span I have E2. So what is the drip is basically average of E1 plus E3 by 2 plus E2. So that is going to be my drip. In case of a system, we call this as a total static moment. Whether you take fixed to fixed or a simply supported beam, the total static moment is always going to be W L square by E. So, whatever the moment P times the drape will be equal to your total static moment. Okay, The total static moment is W L3 square by E. Only by fixity, what we are really doing here is we are taking some moment from mid span and we are pushing it to the support. So, that my mid span moment also will reduce and then I put. So, in that way, continuous system, what we do is we are reducing the moment that is there for what we are designing. So, you end up with a smaller depth and uh, more optimized section. So, even for a continuous system, that that equivalent uniformly distributed load can be easily calculated like this. So, if you tell me what is the total external load, then I can create a system with by choosing P and E, this cable profile, so that I can completely nullify what is the external load that is seen by the system. Even in bridges, we can do. We may design, usually we go for 80, 100 percentage of uh, dead load or you know whatever the design requirement is. So, using this simple concept, again, what is the load that is produced? Again, you know, just going back. The load, uniform load is proportional to P and the curvature change. Here also, you see here, the curvature change is uniform. If I can calculate the curvature change, then I can quickly calculate what is the W that is produced. It is going to be exactly the same. So, that is no different than your statically determined system. Okay, right. So this is again another case. This beam has a two-span system with a unit, you know, with a parabolic cable profile and a linearly varying cable. And you can clearly see here this system. I am going to have a, a vertical uplift force because my external loads are like this. Accordingly, I have chosen this profile. So it's a very simple, straightforward. But in a reality, what we are going to have is we are not going to have this kind of a cable profile. Okay, what we are going to have is a a smoothly varying slope change, okay? Because practically creating a sharp slope change will not be possible. So what we do is we create this kind of a slope change. And in that process, what we are doing is, in the mid span, I will have load due to precess which will be acting upward, but at the support, it will be acting downward, okay? So that aspect we need to cover. So we, by appropriately choosing this point of inflection, I can limit the zone where the downward load, this downward load also now it will go directly to the support. And usually these loads are directly going to the support. It, it, it will affect the behavior of the beam, no doubt, but it, it's not going to significantly uh, change the behavior much. Right. So this is uh, usually what we do is another method for uh, analyzing a continuous system. And uh, let's take an example of a beam with this kind of a cable profile. Now, when I'm stressing it because it's not a statically determined system and I have an intermediate support, now this beam, because of pre-stressing, it wants to lift up. But now, however, I have a support that is there in the middle that will try because the deflection at the support has to be zero, right? So it will try to hold the uplift of the beam by creating a reaction like this, okay? But now, if I can find a reaction, this secondary reaction that is developed due to pre-stress, then I can basically analyze it just like a statically determined. So the whole point is how to calculate this reaction that is induced into the pre-stress, right? Uh, now that is what we are saying. If the beam is not held in position, so it's going to lift up like this. But however, it is going to be held down like this. So it's going to, you're going to create an additional reaction. So you, what you will have is, uh, you, you will have, you need to account for this reaction and what is the moment that is produced by this reaction. Okay, so the moment is going to produce because there is no other external load, right? So the reaction is now acting downward. So it is going to create a like a like an external load. It is going to create like this. 
Okay, so we need to account for. So in a continuous system, due to pre-stressing, I am going to develop secondary reactions and secondary moments that have to be accounted in my design. Okay, so how do we do that? Again, you no, know, like I said, just one more example. You still have the axial force. Now, only thing is now because the beam, we are also creating a vertical load that is going to basically lift the beam up, but the beam cannot lift up. So you're going to have vertical reaction. So your primary moment is going to be always, okay, if you have P and if this eccentricity is downward, we take that moment due to pre-stress is negative because the pre-stressing moment always has to nullify the positive moment that is produced in the span. So the pre-stressing moment will be negative in the mid span and positive at the support. Okay, it is going to be exactly opposite to that of sign convention that what we follow for, uh, you know, your uh, sagging and uh, hogging. However, the secondary reaction, we said that it is going to push the beam downward, right? So because the beam wants to lift up, now the reaction is going to push it down. So it is going to create a positive moment like this. Now, what is that? What is that? It actually does secondary moment. It is basically reducing the beneficial effect of this precessing moment at the support. If I am not careful, if this moment is larger, then I may have, you know, I may not have designed it properly at the support. Okay. So that aspect we need to be really, really careful. Again, so what, how do we create this reaction? We, we can do it, you know, multiple ways of analysis. I have just taken a simple case. You know, what we do is we assume that there is no support. Okay. And we make it statically determinate by removing the middle support. And then we apply conjugate beam method. Okay, in conjugate beam method, we know that uh, the loading will become M by EA diagram. And then, uh, okay, in a positive moment, M by EA loading diagram will be positive when the load is acting downward. It will be upward when the load is negative. Now, for the conjugate beam method, when I'm calculating shear force, it will become the slope for the real beam. And when I'm calculating the bending moment, it will become the deflection. So, what I can do is, of course, these are all the boundary conditions. Uh, we know that uh, for the real beam and conjugate beam method. But in this case, what we have taken is a pin support. So, of course, uh, uh, we are going to allow a pinch, right? So, what we really do here is, this is the moment that is due to the pre-stressing. Okay, that is directly proportional to the eccentricity of the game. At all the section, I know the eccentricity. I calculate that. And assuming that there is no interior, interior intermediate support. So, I create this profile, right? Now, what is that we are doing? So, it's going to create, now for, for a conjugate beam analysis, what we do is, we have to load the beam with M by EA. M by EA is nothing but your curvature. Okay. And uh, of course, why we are doing EA? Because pre-stress section will not have any crack, even if the cracks are there, very, very minor cracks. So, you can assume elastic analysis. So, M by EA will become your curvature. Right. So, you load that beam. Okay. So, uh, that you load that and you calculate, so then you can find your deflection. Just by taking the moment at this point, you get your deflection, right? And now what we do, okay, next step is, okay, we, we did that. Uh, now I need to find a reaction that will create deflection corresponding to that. It will nullify this reaction that what we got from by removing the support. Because actual in actual beam, there is a support that will not allow this deflection to happen. Right. So what we do is we create that. So deflection in the actual structure at uh, the intermediate support has to be zero. Now I need to create a reaction. I have to apply it in such a way that the deflection has to be zero. That is very simple because it's a simply supported beam. I can, if you have a load, basically I can calculate the deflection for a point load and then I can, that deflection, if I equate it, then I can calculate the reaction that is good. So this is a simpler case for a for a very long bridge. I can I can idealize the system like a this kind of a simple system. Okay, even for a very long continuous system, I can put a hinge and I can uh, idealize the structure and still find out the reactions one at a time. Okay, so using this process we can do. So uh, so the the essence what we are trying to tell here is. Due to pre-stressing, there is not only primary moment, there is also secondary moment that will come. Okay, That secondary moment, the question is to, to find the reaction from simple method. Or what we can do is, we can create the uniformly distributed load from the load balancing concept. And I can directly use moment distribution method to find the reactions. 
that will also give me the total final moment that is your m2 moment that is also another approach which is in fact even if you are if, if you are really comfortable with moment distribution method quickly uh, what we can do is we load all the beams with the uniformly distributed in this case and then we do moment distribution method and then we can calculate the final moments like this okay right so that is another approach this is from principle of consistent deformation okay this is just a simple even for a continuous system what i can do is i can idealize the system as a several uh, simple spans with a hinge and then i can still find my reactions and i can quickly calculate this the point in a continuous system is due to pre stressing you are going to develop additional reactions that additional reactions will basically reduce the favorable effect of your pre stressing that need to be accounted in your design okay right so this is what we do we take this total moment including that uh, you know m1 m1 prime and what is happening from your uh, uh, envelope due to external loads then finally we design this moment for okay right so this is a quick process and i think uh, yeah i think i'm all i'm sorry if i if i or five minutes or so i've taken um yeah so in summary i think we talked about uh, what is pre stressing with various examples and we talked in detail about load balancing again load balancing is a very elegant method in fact that was proposed by ty lee a famous bridge engineer and uh, in fact um, i mean that only paved the way for basically uh, rapid use of uh, uh, pre stress technology in bridge construction previously steel used to be preferred uh, construction uh, for longer spans but with advent of this high strength material and elegant approach of easily visualizing the load then processing really caught on and we also discussed about differences between bonded and unbonded systems and advantages of pcs systems and procedure for analyzing a continuous system 